All right, friends. Thank you all for being here today. It is awesome to have you. Uh, first thing that you guys are already started on is I would love to know, this is kind of our check here as to uh, where you are today. And uh, go ahead and open Onyx on a different screen if you can. So glad to have everybody here today. The cool thing about these webinars is there are people from literally all over the world and it is awesome. Folks from all across the US where I am, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. That's what this photo's of. And uh, then we've got people in all kinds of places, including on the couch. Hi, Giancarlo. Um, I have not learned Italian yet, but still glad you are here today. <laughs> Great to have all you guys here. Absolutely. Cool. Looks like every, everything's going, so let's get started. Uh, today, today is the advanced webinar. So we're going to cover a, a number of things today, including a quick Onyx hardware overview and licensing. And then we're going to dive into some different topics, such as uh, moving black, such as uh, main cue list, playback options, effects, and macros, and more. You don't want to miss that. So to, to begin, we always like to introduce ourselves here quick, at least some of us do. And so I'm David Henry here from LearnStageLighting.com, going to be the main teacher here today. We also have with us Mr. Matthias Hendricks product manager from Elation Professional slash uh, Obsidian Control Systems. And uh, you like to introduce yourself, Matthias? Hi there. Well, not much to add here. Um, I hope uh, we, we see a lot of people back from our first two webinars. Welcome back to everyone. Uh, remember on uh, Thursday, we have the fourth one, which is going to be completely focused on the dialers, uh, pixel generators and, and engine that we designed. So there's going to be really some fun stuff um what we're going to dive into the plain old pixel mapping of intensity and color but we're also going to talk about mapping of any other parameter and how we sort of envision dialers to become really our like effects system for onyx so this should be a fun uh, couple of hours there on uh, on thursday and uh, i'll be monitoring today so any questions come up please put them uh, in the q a um, yeah, use the Q&A for uh, actual questions uh, regarding to what we're talking about. Um, if you have any support issues or questions, or maybe you don't know how to get your capture to connect, use the chat. Uh, we'll try to reach out there. So yeah, have a good webinar, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Matthias. And we also have Bob Mentel here, Vertical Market Manager from Elation Professional. Uh, you feel like saying anything, Bob? That's okay if you don't. Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy this this uh, iteration of the training. Um, I, I know I've found them quite interesting. Um, very similarly to Matthias, I'll be in the chat and Q&A answering questions uh, as they come in. So David can just keep the pedal on uh, the gas going and um, go full speed ahead. We have a lot of information to cover. So I'm um, looking forward to it and looking forward to seeing you guys all for the Dylos version on Thursday, which I'm also looking forward to um, uh, because it's going to be great to show off this new effects engine. So enjoy the training, everyone. Awesome. So much good stuff there in the new uh, Pixel Mapper slash effects. It does so many good things. Also, I see in the chat here, we also have Ofer Brum here. I just want to highlight him. He's not going to be um, on the panel per se, but he is here and he helps out with so many things. Uh, support he used to do all the old fixture profiles, but now uh, we've got the new version of those. And uh, he does, he just does so much good work for the team. So I want to highlight him as well because um, we appreciate him. Awesome. And so, uh, I'd love to know quick in the chat as we get started, we do this every time here, um, as to what type of lighting you work with. I always love to see this in the chat. If you just type that in real quick, um, it's always great to know so that uh, I kind of know what's going on, what kind of people we got here today. And as we go through the teaching, we can uh, help you guys with your specific needs a little bit. Awesome. Awesome. So bands, we got to House of Worship lighting, cool, cool, cool. Got some great stuff coming through. Cool, while those come up, um, we wanna talk about how today's webinar will work. As Matthias mentioned, there is a chat section and a Q&A section. For the most part, because we've got these awesome guys here, we got Matthias and Bob, 
uh, they're going to handle most of the chat and Q&A stuff. In fact, I hide the chat um, and they let me know if I need to pay attention to anything. And then in the Q&A, um, that's where if you have questions, you can ask them. And if they uh, are something that uh, pertains to what we're, we're teaching, we'll, we'll take a few breaks to answer those questions. But if there are things that can be answered, uh, you know, simply by typing out a few sentences, then uh, Matias and Bob are going to be on top of those. Now, here's what we need you to do today. We're going to be going through some various things today. And uh, if you can, remove any distractions that you have in your world, okay? Now, whether that means, you know, closing the door like I've got here, um, you know, shutting off your phone, though um, after last time where we had a little Zoom problem, I'm keeping it in front of me just in case uh, the guys have to call me. But, uh, you know, remove any distractions you've got so you could focus fully. Um, if you do miss something and you ask a question about it, then we're probably not going to go over it in the video, but we'll, um, they can help you in the chat. Awesome. Now, Let's get started, guys. The first thing we like to go over in these, though, in the first webinar we went over in, in much greater depth, is the Onyx hardware. You can see here there are a variety of different hardware interfaces available for Onyx, from all the way from the NX4 console down through various PC solutions, wings, uh, and, and etc. So if you're not familiar with all this stuff, you definitely want to check it out. In addition to the Onyx hardware, which typically, um, depending on the particular device, unlocks some sort of output, not all of them, but most of them, we also have the Netron hardware. These are DMX splitters, DMX nodes from Artnet or SACN, and, and just general data management products that are available from the same team at Obsidian Control Systems. They don't unlock output in Onyx, but they are great solutions. And if you do look at Netron, you look at the feature set and you look at the pricing compared to other alternatives on the market, I think you'll find that uh, they've done a really great job with these at making sure these are really well marketed, really well priced. On the licensing side, guys, there's a lot in here, but you can just look across this here and see that there are a variety of different license options. Whether you're on an NX4 or NX2 and you have 64 universes, whether you're on a PC where you can unlock a maximum of 128, or maybe you're just using an NX Touch, which will give you four universes of output uh, via a single D with a single DMX port um, on the unit itself. And so, if you have questions about that, need more info on that stuff, uh, you can ask the guys uh, in the chat, but or the uh, the questions, but also check out the Obsidian Control website because all of that is explained there. Awesome. So. Let's go ahead, and the first thing that I want to talk about today is networking, okay? I, I get a lot of questions on networking. I know other folks do, and what we want to talk about today is some basic networking setups that you may want to set up or you may run into with a Onyx console, okay, or, or a PC. And, um, you know, while every situation is different, there are some basic networking uh, setups and some basic templates we can kind of follow for a lot of situations, specifically if you haven't worked with networking before. So taking a look at the back of an NX4 here in the NX2 is, is very similar. Um, there are two network ports right here on the back of the console, two network ports. And that's one of the things that really sets the consoles apart uh, from the PCs is that you get both network ports. Now, one is labeled Ether DMX and the other is labeled remote. And you'll see those labels inside the software too when you go to set up network interfaces. Uh, and what that means is the Ether DMX port is designed to be used primarily for sending out DMX data for plugging in different nodes and, and different art and SACN devices to the console directly. Whereas the remote port is designed for getting remote control, whether that's through a PC that's wired as a backup, or maybe you're going wireless and, and walking around with the PC using the Onyx remote for iOS, touch OSC, uh, things like that are going to generally happen through the remote port. The nice thing about this is it, it allows them to keep separate so that no matter what you're doing on the remote side, if anything goes wrong there, um, it's not going to affect the network that your DMX output is on. And so 
when it comes to uh, reality and when it comes to the real world and actually setting up a show, um, these are the kind of th these are the kind of setups that we'll often do with Onyx. At the most basic level, you're going to have a console, and it could be a PC, but here I've got an NX4, could be an NX2, etc. And as mentioned, out the Ether DMX, we're just going to just have a network cable straight to a Netron node, okay? And that's all you need. You don't need a router. You don't need a switch. You don't need anything there. Um, we can configure them as Ether DMX, set them within the, the same IP address range, more on that in a second, and we'll be good to go. Then we can use the remote in order to connect to a wireless router or a network with access points if it's a larger facility-wide network, et cetera, or just wired straight to a computer. So I mentioned a minute ago the term IP address, and and I realize that many people here, um, being this is an advanced webinar, you may know what an IP address is, you may know what it does and how it works, but I wanna go over this quick so that we're all on the same page because I know that networking can be definitely scary to some people uh, if you haven't done it before. So when we see an IP address, we're gonna see examples like 192.168.0. And then I put the X, could be dot one, dot four, dot 200, Etc. We also, in Onyx or, or other lighting control um, pieces of hardware like nodes, etc., we might see 2.0.0.x, okay, with the x being the last different, the number that's different. And there are a lot of different examples of this, of, of different IP address ranges, but these are some of the most common that you're going to see. Also, 10.0.0.x. Uh, so, what are these numbers, anyways? To keep it simple and focused on the application here, um, in general, when we're working with lighting networks that tend to be fairly small, the biggest key to remember is you want to keep the first three sets of digits matching in the last different, okay? A lot of the times, Onyx is going to suggest IP addresses like for Ether DMX, and we're just going to go with those and make sure we set everything within that same range, and then we're going to be good to go. The biggest thing is the last number does need to be different. And that number is going to range from technically from 0 to 255. Um, but in reality, one is often taken by a router. And uh, up in the upper end, there are some that are typically reserved. But anywhere from 1 to you know 240 is often great. Now, what governs this, just to go a little deeper, what governs the fact that we keep the first three numbers generally the same and the last different is what's called a subnet mask. Now, a subnet mask is a filter for your network. 255 means it needs to match, and zero means it needs to be different. So in lighting, we're, we're most commonly going to see these top two. Okay, 255.255.255.0. That means that any two devices in the network, whether it's a console and a computer, whether it's a console and a node, whether it's two different nodes or a console and two different nodes, um, if they have the subnet mask 255.255.255.0, that means the first three sets of digits match, the last can be different and it needs to be. Um, if it's 255.0.0.0, you have the flexibility where only the first set of digits needs to match, the next three can be different, which allows you to use more devices in that subnet, but also means that they're listening to more uh, IP addresses on the network, which generally is not an issue, but could become that. You also, if you do work with larger networks, facility-wide networks, etc., you may see a subnet mask like 255.252.0.0, and whenever you get a number that's not zero or 255, um, I would recommend going doing your homework or if you don't feel comfortable, talk to a networking professional. These allow you to filter um, even deeper partial ranges within a, a given octet, um, one of these, these sets of digits. And uh, they can be useful in larger networks, but truth be told with a lot of smaller lighting networks where you're hooking up a console, a handful of nodes, and that's it. You don't need to get any more complex than 255.255.255.0 or 255000. Uh, as I mentioned, there's many examples. So let's just walk through how we would assign some IP addresses in a typical Onyx network.
So once again, we've hooked up our console to EtherDMX 2.0.0.1, and we're, we've connected that directly to the, the Netron node at 2.0.0.2. Now, when it comes to the remote port, it's a completely different interface. And so that interface can actually operate on a completely different set of IP addresses on a completely different range, and that's fine. Um, each network interface is a completely different range, a completely different network, okay? So we could have that at 192.168.0.2 could be where we set our remote interface with our, our router being 192.168.0.1 and then devices that are connected to that router wirelessly, the PC again, iOS devices, tablets running touch OSC, those all could be in 192.168.0.3, same little typo there, to uh, 192.168.0.255, okay? And, and being connected to a router, um, the router is going to send out what's called DHCP, where for those PCs, iOS devices, et cetera, they'll automatically get their IP address from the acceptable range because the router is going to assign those. Another networking example, just if we had more nodes, we could go ahead and we could connect up those up uh, a variety of ways. So one way is we could have a node that's 2.0.0.2, one that's dot three, one that's dot four. And because the Netron nodes have switches built into them, they have two network ports, you can go ahead and cascade those. Um, now, the, the benefit is that you don't need a different network switch. The downside is if this first one loses power for some reason, then it's not going to pass that ethernet data anymore. And also you don't wanna cascade more than about eight or so um, different devices. Again, it depends a lot on the application, the amount of data you're sending, um, but eight to 10 is generally a, a good recommendation on the, the maximum you'd wanna do in a single run. And of course, as mentioned, that's not just for the, the latency, of the, the tiny bit of time that it takes for the, the packets to come in, the information for the device to retransmit it and then to go to the next one. But it's also just for reliability. Um, these are reliable units, but at the end of the day, a power cord can jiggle loose. You know, something can happen. It could get shocked with a huge static shock or have um, some, some bad power, bad voltage fry it, you know. And if that happens, then it won't keep cascading through. Uh, so, when you're either getting a lot of nodes or you want to split them out or they're just far apart from each other, then you may want to go with more of a star topology like this, where you go ahead and have the Ether DMX come out of the console, go into a basic network switch. Um, the most basic ones have no management. They're called an unmanaged switch and they are great for the kind of things we do. Um, until you get into doing larger things, there's really no need for that management. Um, a lot of simple, you know, ArtNet or SACN networks work great just with the built-in, um, just with no management, just with an unmanaged switch. And then you can connect up each unit to the switch itself. All right. And so that's pretty simple as well. Um, and so, and so those are the basics of kind of how we would set up networking within Onyx. Now I want to walk through the settings in the menu that, that are in regards to this as well. So I'm just going to load my show from the webinar the other day. It's the same as the show file you downloaded, but I have a few more presets and cues in it just for the sake of the examples today that we'll get into later. Uh, but for networking, it's really just as simple as going up to the network, to the network, sorry, to the menu here, and then going into the main menu. And down here in the network options is where we're going to work with networking inside Onyx. Uh, the basic gist here is the first one we have here is settings. Okay. This is going to show us any network shows that there are. We can click on and join a different network show that is, um, that is going to be uh, able to, to join. We are going to also um, see the different devices on the network that are able to be found. We'll show the different interfaces. So here on a PC, I see Ethernet, Ethernet 2, and Wi-Fi. But on the consoles, you're going to see, um, you know, the Ether DMX versus the remote port. And then we're able 
on each interface, we're able to set our network settings over in the right side. So we talk about Ether DMX a lot. That's just the term that's used in Onyx, the name for when we're sending networked data. Okay. And so uh, what it does is it assigns an IP address, automatically generates it um, for you to send Ethernet uh, DMX data uh, for ArtNet, um, but it'll work for SACN as well as other protocols. Um, it's just kind of the default setup that's built into here to help you get moving faster. Whenever you do set settings in here, you always want to hit apply, save those settings uh, to make sure everything is live and active with your network. Um, then if you do happen to have uh, ArtNet devices that, that feature the ArtNet polling, under Ether DMX here, where you can turn on um, each different interface, you can turn on the types of data that you want to send. You'll find that on the settings page. On the devices page, if there are ArtNet devices that, that support that auto discovery, such as Netron devices, then you will see them pop up here and you will have the ability to do some management of that. All right. And so that's important as well. Very cool. So um, with that, guys, let's hop back to the slides real quick before we go deeper and uh, just talk about support real quick. Then we're going to really dive in and talk about uh, delay and fade presets and some really good stuff there. So one of the questions that we get, and I just always like to get to early in the webinar, is um, where do you find support after a webinar like this? And so this isn't the end of the webinar by any means. It's just letting you know after the webinar, these are the places to look. Um, and the, the main hub is obsidiancontrol.com. We've walked over this in the other webinars, but it's got all the links to all the places that I'm about to talk about. Um, then we go ahead and uh, we're going to go to support.obsidiancontrol.com. This is the manual. It's also available in the help section in the main Onyx menu in the actual software or on the consoles. Then we've got the Onyx forums, all right? So the Onyx forums are where you can get tech support if you're hitting an error, a bug, somehow you're hitting a crash or you've got something going on. You can uh, write about those here and this is the, the official tech support for Onyx. We also have the Facebook group. While not an official tech support, um, it is the place to go when you've got uh, shows that you've done, or you know, in this case, live streams or pre-recorded things that you want to show. Maybe you've got a question about programming style or something like that. Um, that is a great uh, part of that as well. And then last but not least, when we get back to meeting in person with people again, there will be live trainings again by elation. Um, and so uh, those will happen again. They're a great way to dive deep. Uh, I've had the, the privilege to be able to teach some of those in the past, and uh, they're really awesome. And so you can go ahead and uh, really dive in, get in front of a console with the visualizer, dive deep into programming, ask any questions you want, and uh, really get a lot going on there. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the version of Onyx that we had in the, uh, the folder here. Whoops, pop this over here, drag it out a little. And I'm gonna pull up the good old capture file that we've been going through. And bring everything back up here. Resize it real quick. And then we're gonna talk about delay and fade presets. So we started to get into this in the last webinar. Uh, but it's the kind of thing you don't want to just gloss over and, and halfway answer. You really want to go over deeply. And so for that, I want to show you exactly how to set up some really cool stuff here. So I've gone ahead, as you note, I loaded the show file. I had made some presets in here during the last webinar. Those aren't required uh, for what we're doing here today. If you just open the, the file from blank, that's great as well, but they will help me to explain things a little quicker so you don't have to watch me go create a bunch of color presets, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, so a lot of times people ask about, and we talked about in the, the end of the last webinar, about, okay, I can go ahead and type in, maybe I type in fixture uh, one through 10. So I'll go ahead and pull this up. Should just pull up my keypad off to the side here. I could type in one through 10 at full. 
And when I record 1 Fleur 10 at full into a queue, I'll zoom out so we can see it a little better, those lights are all going to come up at the same time. However, it can look really cool and be a really great addition to your show to be able to have that happen um, with a delay or with different fades on them. Okay. And so we discussed one of the things you can do, and we'll discuss here, is you can hit this delay key. Okay. So you can hit this delay. And then if you want to delay all the parameters that are fading in uh, within the queue, you can press delay one through 10. Let's just say one through five so it doesn't take forever to load. This is in seconds, by the way. Enter. So nothing happens visibly on the screen. We're not seeing anything happen in the moment that we type it. But we do see it in the program. And we see that it fans that delay out, that fixtures one through 10 here have a delay on them across all the parameters for um, one second to five seconds. Let's clear that, do another example. Maybe I take one through 10 at full again. And this time I hit delay and then I hit the intensity parameter or I could uh, click on the, the encoder wheel on the console. Okay, then it says set delay channel and then it has the name of the parameter which is intensity. And then I say zero through five, enter. Awesome, and I accidentally selected everything but we can see that it does go ahead and um, fan everything on a zero to five second. Okay, and that's okay. That'll work for this example. So now I'll go ahead and I'm going to record this to a queue just so we can see what's happening here. And in that queue list, I'm going to just call it um, delay example queue. And then what we're going to see, and this is cool, is when we press this through, now the lights in the order that we selected them delay from one second to five second incoming on. Okay, that's nice, but it's a lot of work to every time you want to do this to type in that delay timing, etc. So we can store it in a preset as well. So for this example, I'm going to go one through 10. And then I'm going to just type delay. And in this case, I'm going to do it over all the parameters. Okay. And I'm going to do zero through five through zero. Now that command with the through in there twice is a little different than what we did before, right? Before we just did start to end of the selection. So fixture one was at zero delay, fixture five or fixture 10 rather was at five seconds delay. This puts the five seconds in the center, which is cool when our lights are in a straight line like this, because then it's zero through five through zero. So we're going to get a outside to in type delay. If we wanted to go the opposite of that, basically inside to out, we could have typed five through zero through five. So we'll press enter. Now we have that info in our programmer across all our parameters. And now I'm gonna press record. I am going to select just time and I'm going to turn on all these filters so that all the parameters get stored. And then I'm going to press on uh, any of my presets. For this example, I'm going to go and put them in beam effects just because I don't have anything else there. And so I don't get confused. It's just an organizational thing. You could select these filters, make sure time selected. You could do fan fannings like these in intensity for just intensity, in pan tilt for just pan tilt, color for just color, etc. Uh, here I'm doing it over all the parameters, so I'm going to put it right here. Awesome. So we've got that there. We see that it has all the types of parameters in them. It has a name. Uh, we're going to call this delay fan center. And so now if we clear that out and we're going to, to do some programming, we go ahead, we select our spots, we apply full, and then we send them somewhere. We can now record this to a queue. We're going to call it, oops, we're not going to record to queue. We're going to hit our delay preset. Very important step. Okay, now we see here, we've got the parameters, we've got the different um, presets we've hit. And then we also have the different uh, 
the various different delays in there, okay, on the delay. And that's the important part when we're talking about delay presets. Now we record that. Delay example two, we clear that out and we play it back. What we see here is a outside to inside delay. So it's going from the outside to the middle delay as it sweeps in. Now, depending on what you're doing, uh, zero to five seconds to zero, um, that becomes, that's kind of slow, right? But you can easily do this zero to two seconds, you know, zero to three seconds, et cetera. And you get a really great sweep. Not only that, but you could do things like you could have multiple of these that you select when you record, or you could have one that's maybe your template that records to cues, and you could create two, three, four, five other delay presets, and then you can actually merge those into the one that you put in the cues to change the type of delay you're doing and do that live and on the fly. Okay, so there's a lot of, you know, it, like many things in Onyx, there's a lot under the hood and a lot you can do with it. Um, at the simplest level though, at least going, if you're gonna use a delay or fade type, taking it, dialing in that, that delay or fade you like, saving it to a preset with all the filters on, uh, is gonna allow you to, in one click, give yourself a transition left to right, you know, front to back, up to down, whatever order you want. So that instead of just a normal fade where things just fade in, you get something much more interesting and much more cool looking. Uh, so we used on these ones, I'd use delay with this button here, delay, which is also on the consoles. There's also fade. So delay is going to be delaying those, those fade times when the queue starts. Fade changes the fade time per each parameter. And so in that case, uh, it's going to, if you have a longer fade time, those parameters will start fading at the same time, but they'll take longer to complete the fade than a parameter of lesser fade time within that same queue. Um, but the process is exactly the same. The syntax, what you type, um, all of this stuff is exactly the same kind of thing. All right. Um, while we're in presets, let's talk about, because there's that delay and fade presets are great, and uh, you definitely should use them on every show if you don't. Uh, they're, they're super helpful. Um, are embedded presets. We've got embedded presets. What are embedded presets? Well, I made a little demo here, but I'm going to recreate it right here for you again. Where What I've done here is I've taken my spots and I've created a guitar position. I know these are rough. I just made them uh, with the capture with right clicking to focus the lights. Then the drums vocals, and bass. Okay, I made these four positions. I put all 10 of these spots in those four positions, okay? Now, if I want to create a band preset, as I did here, but I'm going to delete it so I don't get confused. If I wanted to create a band preset, I actually could build it off of these individual presets so that whenever I'm updating these presets, I go to a new venue, we move things around on the stage, um, I can just go ahead and update the individual presets and then the, the together preset or the full band preset is automatically updated. How do we do that? Well, embedded presets are exactly how they do that. And they, they work both ways. They work uh, forwards, as I just mentioned, and also backwards in a sense. Let me demonstrate. So say I go ahead and I grab my first two lights and I put them in the guitar position. And then let me actually turn off this cue. So we're just going to take one through 10 at full so we can see them. And then I'm going to take, let's see, do I have any cues running? No, cool. Then I'm just going to take one and two and select them. They're going to go to the guitar position, three, four, going to the drums five, six, again, this is an art, going to the vocal over there at the keyboard, seven, eight at the bass, nine, 10 at the lead singer. Again, it's not art, but it does illustrate the point well. Now I'm gonna go ahead, now that I've taken all these and selected, I'm gonna press record and press on a new preset button. 
Now we see this window pop up. Maybe you've seen this window pop up. I know it's one that I get questions a lot on and people say, what do I do here? Do I use the embedded references? Do I break the embedded references? Well, for this example, we're gonna use them because ultimately that's what I am uh, demonstrating here. And so when, when we press use embedded references, we get a little E in the bottom corner. That lets us know we've got embedded references in there, which is helpful. So I'm gonna name this band and then we can go ahead and if I clear and I select that group and I take them to band, I'll turn on highlight here, they go exactly there, right? I take them somewhere else and I take them to band, they go to the band, okay? If I go ahead now and I take all my spots on my guitar, okay? So I've got all these, the guitar moves on stage to up here because he thinks he's amazing and he's just gonna stand on top of the set. I can now go, record the guitar preset, merge it in. You always want to merge, um, replace will break that, that reference. So we're going to merge that guy in, clear it out again, and this time grab the spots again, put them in the band position. Now we see our poor guitarist is in the dark because we moved his couple lights up here, okay? So when we updated this preset, which is part of the band preset, it updated forward. Okay. In addition, we can also update backwards in a sense. If I select just these two fixtures and I point them back at our guy, and then I go ahead and record to the band preset and merge, I now get a pop up about embedded re presets that are a little bit different. Um, this time it says, Do I want to update the source presets? That is what I'll do, or break the embed. So anytime you see break the embedded, you know, when you're recording initially, break all embedded references, or when I'm updating a preset um, here, if you do say you're gonna break the embedded references, now these two lights that in the band preset were focused on the guitar, they're gonna say pointed to the same position, but they're not going to be linked back to the guitar preset anymore. They're not gonna be embedded, okay? So when I update the source presets, now I can see if I get, if I bring these lights back, these two will go right to the guitar. However, the remaining eight lights that were formerly pointed at the guitar are still up in the air because we updated backwards from the band preset down to these bass presets. And in the band preset, there were only those first two lights because the other eight lights were pointed at other band members. And so with embedded presets, you can go both ways with updating and it can be helpful, especially uh, during a show or if you don't have a lot of time. But do keep in mind that if the source preset, in this case, each band member preset has more lights on it than the destination does, then um, if you update the destination, only the lights that are in that one are going to update, which, which probably makes a lot of sense there, all right? Um, let's take a minute and take any questions you guys have on the embedded presets and the delay and fade presets, um, because I know they can offer a little bit of confusion, especially if it's something you haven't worked with before. I'll grab a quick sip of tea and uh, then we will uh, take any questions that pop in. And if not, we'll move ahead to uh, Move in Black and Mark. Okay, Ben says, can you explain how to add fade or delay to cues after the cues are made? Well, sure. So it's gonna work the same way as previous to a cue. We're just going to open that cue for editing first or merge into that cue, okay? Um, and so we went over that in the last webinar. Um, and so you'll definitely wanna check out the intermediate webinar, but if the cues, just one example would be, I would select my units one through 10, I could hit my delay, zero through five through zero. And I typed something wrong there in the middle. Let me try that again. Delay zero through five through zero, enter. And then I could into an existing queue, record say Q1, if it was Q1 and press that, merge the current data into it, you'd be good to go. You could also open the queue for updating uh, with the uh, edit queue syntax um, as well. We went over all that good stuff as well.
Awesome. I know there's a few people with the questions about repeating, et cetera. Um, I think those are going to be uh, best answered if you go and watch the replay when they put this up. It is being recorded. There is a replay. Um, so you can watch it over as many times as you need for that. Awesome. Very cool. Um, another example, just because it came through and we do have a minute for it, is to have delay being different for uh, different parameters. Sure. So say we go ahead, we take our spots here and we do, we take them to full and we do delay, intensity, zero through five, enter. And then we pan tilt them to the downstage center position or maybe the fan position. I like that one better. And then I say, Delay, I click the pan tilt group this time instead of the individual because I want pan and tilt. And we say at, so I did on the first one, I did zero through five. And so this time I'm going to do five through zero. So it's going in the opposite direction. We can see that in our programmer. So pan tilt are five through zero, intensity zero through five. Record that guy. This is a secondary example. Clear twice and play it. And there we see it's not the most dramatic example ever, but the lights on the very end, um, they, they came up with their intensity first and moved last, whereas the ones in the center moved while they were dark mostly, and then the intensity came on later. And so, uh, those are those are two different options, different ways to be able to use what we just learned. Awesome. Let's go ahead and talk about move in black or mark. So I'm going to just move a couple of these cues out of here real quick so I have a little bit of room to work. Matthias asked me to cover move in black. Uh, he mentioned, and I'd seen this too, that there were a lot of questions. There's been a lot of questions on the Facebook and in the forum about move in black and what that functionality is, how it works and when and how you should use it. So move in black is a function that is built into Onyx um, and it's designed, it's historic, at least historically, is that it's for theatrical type cue lists where you've got a number of cues in a row and you have uh, places in there, maybe you're lighting a musical or a theater or a dance piece or what, what have you, and there's places where um, from one cue to another, there are lights that were dark, they were off. And then in the next cue, they move to a new position. Okay. And mo what Move in Black does is they, that allows you to pre-move the lights while it's dark so that the audience doesn't see it. You can customize the rate that it, this happens at. And, um, and then you can go ahead and have it automatically pre-move those lights for you when they're dark, whenever it's possible. Now, there's a few caveats to this that we'll get into, and I'll, I'll show you through an example. Um, the biggest caveat is it has to be within a single cue list. Why? Because ultimately, if you go from one cue list to another and you expect it to move in black automatically, the, the software doesn't know, Onyx doesn't know where you're going if you're switching between two different cue lists. So it can't automatically pre-move those lights for you. It can't read your mind. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions that we see with Move in Black is people think, oh, it's just going to take the lights and make them move in the dark um, no matter what I do. It's not quite like that, but it is very valuable, especially when working with a theatrical style cue list, which isn't just for theater. Um, it also can definitely be used in film and TV, corporate shows, house of worship, all across the board, um, even for band lighting sometimes, they'll use it. Um, the biggest key is keeping it all in one cue list. So let's do a uh, example. So I'm gonna make a cue list here where we're going to take our spots, bring them to full, point them at the stage. Then we'll take these fuse washes. Oops, they're not in there, that's okay. take them to full, 
we will point them forward. We will give them a nice color. And we'll record that as Q1. Then we're going to go ahead, Q2, the fuse washes are going to go out. So intensity goes out, nothing else changes. Um, the, the point of moving black is you don't have to think ahead to where they're going to be preset wise. So we'll record enter for Q2. Then we move them. So I'm going to point them at the backdrop here. I'm going to turn them on. I'm going to record that as a third Q. Awesome. And then we're going to go and um, for a fourth cue, we will turn off the spots, record that. And then for a fifth cue, we turn the spots back on, but this time they are pointed. We'll use the downstage center preset. We should always use presets. And we record that as a fifth cue. Awesome. And so what we get, if we play that back as recorded, is Q1, I'm actually going to go to the Q list values here, pop a data mode and, and uh, name these. So call wash with our front light and blue. Then our next Q name will be wash out. Then we go ahead and have Q3 where the wash lights move to the background. Then we have the spot out. And then in the last queue, we have our spots move to downstage center. Awesome. So we saw when we watched through these, right, that if we play through it again from the start, that every time we move the lights, like here from Q2 where the washes are off to Q3, we see them move. They don't move automatically. And in some situations, it definitely would make sense, you know, if you don't want to see that movement, to have them move automatically. And that's exactly what Move in Black does. So what we'll do is we will stop the queue list. We will go into our queue list options, right clicking on a PC, turn mark on. Now we have a couple options. The first is mark per queue list, and that's what we're going to use right now. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and press play. And what we'll see again, first queue looks the same, but then the washes go out. We'll zoom in and they just moved automatically. Okay, so much so that when I play the next cue, all they do is move up, okay? And so that's what Move in Black is. Move in Black looks for any light that has zero intensity that then comes on in a later cue. Okay, so in a particular cue, it has no intensity, then it comes on again, and it may change color, it may change gobo, it may change position, um, and any of that stuff is going to move automatically in black, okay? Again, we'll go to Q4, and the same thing's going to happen with our spots. Now they're moving, and now they're in position before we play our next Q. Now, what if you wanted only the first one to do move in black and not the second? In the Q list options, that's why we got the mark per Q, okay? And so the mark per Q allows you to then go in and mark toggle and so you just press on the cue that you want to toggle. So I'm going to do the wash out toggle mark for that one. Actually, I think I toggle it for the wash to BG. Truth be told, I use the, the full mark much more often. And we'll play it back. It's Q1, Q2, washes go out. Yep. By Q3, they had moved. Now I, I jumped the gun a little bit on that. So we'll go ahead and play that again. So we'll take them out. And so we've marked the next cue. 
And so they've moved now. Again, hard to see, but that's the purpose. Now they've moved, so they're they're not moving. But then here the spots are going to go out. And they're not going to move in black because we've used the mark toggle and the mark per Q option. And so now we get the cool, we, we see the movement effect of that going. And so uh, for most often, I would say if you're using move in black, if, if you use it, I would use mark per Q list more often than not. But there are going to be times for sure where you're in a show and you say, okay, I want to mark, but I only want it to mark sometimes. And in that case, you can press the mark toggle. Remember that the mark toggle goes on the queue that um, the mark is going to happen by, right? The queue where the light moves, not the queue where the light's off. Um, you mark the queue where the light moves and then only those queues will mark. It's not gonna happen automatically for the rest of your queues, okay? Now, if you do want to modify the timing of the mark, okay? Because you notice it just kind of happens um, it doesn't happen too fast, but you can change those timings to be whatever you'd need them to be. Those are going to be in the main menu, here in menu, then Q settings, mark Q, and you see here there's a, there's a delay of 0.3 and then a fade of two seconds. So that means after the previous Q fades in all the way, it waits those 0.3 seconds on the delay, so it just waits, then it starts fading the lights over two seconds. I find this is good for a lot of things, but if you're in an environment where you want the lights to mark real slow, you can do that. You can you can set this up to a much higher number, be good to go. You just run the risk if you need to quickly move ahead, say you set a 10 second fade, and then within 10 seconds, maybe five seconds into that, you need to move forward, okay? Um, and uh, And you are able to do that as well. Okay. Awesome. So that is Mark. Um, it does work with um, any parameter. I mean, not intensity, of course, because intensity is the thing that it doesn't do, but it, but it does work with gobos, colors, things like that. Uh, the biggest key is, is that you have that parameter in the queue list. You turn the light off, then you turn the light back on. And it's, it's when it turns back on that it will be marked by. And so I know there was a, a question that came in a minute ago. Bob answered. Thank you, Bob. Um, about doing it with color, you have to make sure that the parameter is in a previous queue within this queue list, okay? So for your first queue, oftentimes it makes sense to hit load, load or something like that, record every parameter for every light. Um, that's not a default um, because that parameter has to be in the queue list. Then the intensity goes out, then that parameter changes, and then it will move in black successfully and uh, you won't have any problems there. Awesome. While we're here, this is a really great place also to mention the as main functionality that's here inside Onyx. So you might have heard me say that and gone, David, what does as main mean? That I've never heard of that. It doesn't sound like anything I need. What's the point, right? <laughs> well, as main allows you to actually kind of get like an extra playback on your Onyx surface for free. What do you mean? Well, uh, so in the Qlist directory, so we'll scroll down and find that. Number 15 on our playbook here. We have this little button here called as main. Maybe you've never noticed it before. I know I hadn't noticed it um, for years after, you know, starting with Onyx. And what as main allows you to do, if you press it, is it takes whatever cue list you have selected. Okay, it could be on a fader, it could not. And it makes it what's known as the main cue list. Now, if you're in a piece of Onyx hardware, such as an NX wing like I'm on today, um, a touch, a NX2, NX4, you've got the big go back, um, the main go and backslash pause buttons. And those are what are called the main cue lists. Now by default, if you're just clicking around and you select different cue lists, whichever one has the white box around it and is selected is going to be your main cue list. However, if you select something out of your queue list directory here, like here, this queue list seven, it's not on any faders or buttons, but I can click as main and then that queue list will always be on the go and back buttons. So I can hit my, my main go button like I just did and it's going to fade in. 
it's going to play. I can use the pause. I can use the back and they work. And I don't have to, like if this is a main cue list that I want to run through, maybe I keep up my uh, cue list values right here. Then I don't have to use up a fader for a cue list where I probably won't ever bring that fader down from full if it's my main show cue list, right? It's, it's the kind of thing that's going to set, you know, various parameters for my lights, but it may, um, but it's not going to, um, you know, be something where I need to move the fader on. If that's the case, then well, stick it to as main because uh, then you can have it on the big buttons. You can press go when you need to, press back when you need to. You can see that at the top of the screen, it's always going to tell you where you're at. And it's also going to, um, it's also going to go ahead and uh, allow you to have that big button there, free up that fader. It's a really great option. And I know it's one of those things that can be confusing. If you see it, you're like, what is this? Um, that's exactly what it is. Awesome. Before we move on from move in black and as main, um, I think I saw a couple questions in there. Were there any other questions or examples uh, that were needed? On these topics. Awesome. I'm not seeing anything come up, so that's that's all good. Cool. I'll wait just a second more, grab a quick sip of tea, because then we get to talk about uh, different playback options and uh, so the different cue lists, et cetera. Great. Awesome. So good. Okay. So cue list and playback options. As we've discussed, I'm just going to turn off this as main so it doesn't drive me crazy. Um, as we discuss, there are in, in previous, what well, we discussed in previous webinars, if we go to record and we're going to make a new cue list, there are six, well, actually seven, if we include Cube Blender, different types of playbacks that we have inside of Onyx and each have their own strengths. And so in this section of the webinar, we want to go ahead and highlight those strengths, show you uh, what they do, how to, to make the best of them, and most importantly, how multiple types of cue lists and multiple cue lists of the same type work together. We're also going to dive into the various cue list options, which do vary for each type of cue list and give some examples there. So first things first, uh, what we've been working with so far, for the most part, are regular red cue lists, just called the cue list type of cue list. And what they do, as we mentioned in the previous webinar, is as we move the fader up and down, we get intensity control. We don't control any other parameters, okay? And um, as we uh, press play, we move forward between our various cues. But we can also click on our, our cog here and open our cue list options, and we have a variety of options that we're able to work with. Some of these options are unique to the cue list type. Others are uh, found among different cue lists, and so we'll highlight them here. All right. So the, the first tab here we have is general. Actually, before I do that, I, we should note that you can change the mode of the cue list. See, my lights are moving because I'm changing the mode using the side of the cue list options here. So even if you recorded something as a cue list and you really want it to be a time code or a chase or what have you, you can change that at any time. There are also a general options tab here of some global options and the ability to unblock the cue list um, if you've done any blocking along the way. So back to cue list, uh, the general um, tab here. The first thing we're gonna see is priority. Different, uh, different types of cue lists are gonna have this. And it is what it sounds like. Um, it starts at 50 and it's basically a percentage-based priority weighting in the sense that um, what you're gonna do is it's gonna be from zero to 100. Um, 100 means that 
when that cue list is playing back, you know, only something that's at the same priority level would be able to override that cue list. Anything at the normal 50 priority level, uh, if you hit play on that and there's a cue list that has all the parameters in it that's at a higher priority, um, then it's just not going to win. Um, the lower priority is just not going to be able to play, not going to be able to get output. Um, that higher priority is always going to win. So that can be useful um, if you have something that you want to make sure when that, that cue is playing, that fader's up, it's going to be getting output. You can set that priority higher. Okay, you can type the number. Um, you can also plus and minus by single digits, the center two, or the plus plus and minus minus uh, moves you up and down by tens as well. Next, we have tracking. So the tracking options are for tracking. Now, we talked about tracking in a previous webinar, so we're not going to go over that again here. Um, but if we turn off tracking, the biggest key here is that when we record cues, only what we had in the programmer um, is going to come through from previous cues. So if we had a cue list where, like, for example, this move in black demo, and we turn off tracking, then through our cues two, we lose our intensity on our uh, spots and washes, but then we don't get our spots intensity back um, until much later when we manually bring that back. Um, so by default, tracking is on. Uh, we discussed that the other day. When you do have different cues stacked on top of each other, parameters that aren't changed, things that you didn't change from a previous queue in the same queue list, they're gonna come through to those future queues. But you can turn that off on a, on a buy queue list option if you so desire. Um, not really my cup of tea, but you know I've, I've used tracking for uh, quite a while and I appreciate it. Uh, we have the ability to retrack all parameters, uh, to track first to last, okay? And so uh, what that's going to do, track first to last means that it actually tracks around right from the end so that the last queue, if you play that through to the first queue again, um, what you're going to find is that um, those parameters actually track around from the end to the start, okay? And to retrack all parameters, it, it is by default on as well. Um, what that's gonna do is if you're backtracking into queues, it's on by default again, if you backtrack, um, it's going to read even further back to make sure there's, you know, something tracking through. Or if you start the queue list in the middle of a queue, for example, um, it's going to look back. It's going to say, okay, you know, this light previously had this parameter. It was on. It was in this position. We're going to bring that in. That's a pretty standard feature in most lighting software these days. Um, but if you hate retrack all parameters, you can turn it off. That's no problem. The option is there. Um, we also have the mark. We went over mark, of course. So we had that on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the whole mark per queue list on for this uh, particular queue list. Then we have our release time. So this is when we stop or release the queue list. Okay. That is the timing on that. So here it plays. It's a two and a half second fade in. We stop it. It's a three second um, fade out. That is the default. Um, you can change it though, as needed, of course. There also is fade out first, which is a cool one. Um, so when you're releasing, by default, what you saw was, I'll just, I'll show you again. Without, in normal times, without fade out first, you stop it. And the, uh, the lights you see, they all move, et cetera. Oh, you know, I think it was, I think you have to stop the cue list and restart it whenever you change fade out first. Um, and so you're totally able to do that. But if, but you see the lights move as it fades out. Whereas if we have fade out first on, and we take, you know, we go to our queue, wherever we're at here, I'll go to Q3. The lights are pointing at this wall. Now, instead of moving while they fade out, they fade out the intensity first, and then they move. Now you see these spots moving because they're turned on um, from a, uh, an, a, a queue somewhere else. And so I can actually just, if we're talking about release here, there are a couple of release options that are available too that, uh, that 
that work here. So first of all, we can block the global release, which I'm not going to do right now. But we have these snap and release keys on the consoles. And the difference between holding snap and pressing release and holding release and pressing snap is actually quite ingenious. Let me show you. So first I'm going to hold snap and then press release. So there, they fade out first, then they move, okay? Just like that fade out first. If I do it the opposite and I hold release and hit snap, we watch them move and fade out at the same time. Just everything releases at exactly the same time. Okay, and so that's super cool because if you're going along here and you're in a show at the end of the night, whatever, and you're releasing, you want to start shut everything off for the night, or you're in the middle of a set and you want to go to a blackout by releasing everything because you've got a cue, you know, that you're going to fire when you come out of that blackout. Um, then you can go, if you hold snap and then press release, the first option, it's just going to much more elegantly fade those lights out because it's going to release everything. Uh, it's going to release all those lights, but they're first going to fade out. All the intensities go away first. So you're not seeing that funny, you know, deal like you saw there where, I'll do it again. Release and then snap where the moving lights start moving and the gobos, you know, move out and you see that moving through the gobo wheel and the colors desaturate and all that jazz. You see all that. Um, if you use holding snap and then pressing release, you miss all of that stuff and it is glorious. Um, so that's fade out first is really the same. It just forces it to always be that way on this particular cue list when you stop it. Um, so as I mentioned, block global release, that one, boom, I got that on. I try to snap and release. I'm hitting the buttons on my console. They're not doing squat. That's really great for important things like maybe a stage wash, uh, things like that, maybe some, you know, backstage lights or whatnot. Um, you, you definitely don't want those to be able to be released um, accidentally. And that's a great way to do that. A reset to first queue. Default is that that guy is on. And what that does is when we stop, as we've seen here, and we restart, we are able to go ahead and it, it's going to start, sorry, it's going to start at the first queue, okay? And so that's the default. Again, if you wanted to stop, like you turn that off, and then we'll just run a quick demo here. We go to our third queue, and then we stop it. And then we play it again. We start at the third queue again. Not typically what you want to do, you know, not typically at least what I uh, think to do. Um, but again, you've got the option. Um, stay alive, place the Bee Gees uh, while your queue is playing and uh, make sure you're paying attention. And then, no, really, what Stay Alive actually does is it keeps that queue from releasing. So, a good example, a demo of this, I'll just demo this one because this one's really good to demo is say I turn off everything. I'll do a snap release there. And I take my first group at full and I point them at the stage and I give them a color and I record that. We'll call this uh, staying alive. And then I go ahead and I make a cue with the same parameters. So I take the lights to 75%, I make them blue or uh, white, mm, amber, amber's good. And I point them somewhere, such as this fan in the audience. And I record that as a cue list. Now I'm gonna go into the cue list options here turn on stay alive. I'll turn it on just the first cue list. The second cue list, I will not turn it on. And then when I clear this, what's going to happen is the second cue list, when I play it, should, in, in normal settings, make the first cue list stop and dump out and release, okay? However, if I put staying alive on, I can now stop the second cue list and the first cue list is it transitions back to that. It doesn't dump that out, okay? So as an example, I've got that second cue list active. I go play the first. It's now dumped out that second cue list, okay? And now if I stop the first cue list, 
since Stay Alive was not on on the second one, it get it's dumped out. We don't go back to that. We're just kind of dark. Okay, so Stay Alive allows you to keep those those queue lists active um, that have been completely overridden. Again, that one more than anything. I mean, a lot of these they're they're options. They're very preferential things, right? About how you are used to working. Um, there's not really a pro or con terribly with it. It's just okay. Do you want if something's overridden? Do you want it to hang around so that if you release a queue list, you'd go back there? Um, or just as another example, if I played Staying Alive one, and then I go to two, and then oh, let me turn off Stay Alive two on that first one, so that we're in the normal, the default settings without Stay Alive on. So one, we play two, one goes away, but that's okay because I could hit. I could hit uh, play on one again. So we get the same result, whether we had stay alive off, which is the default, and we just played, we just fit, went in the forward realm, pressing play, play, play. Whereas if we have staying alive on, we then have the ability to um, play and then play the second cue, which overrides, and then stop that, go back to the, the first cue that has the same parameters in it. Um, that's only if the cues are getting overridden which means that all the parameters in that queue have, have been um, played, you know, something new or has been played that touches all those parameters. If you have a queue list that touches everything, you know, every parameter for every light, and then you play a queue list that only touches five lights, it's not going to override that, that full uh, queue list. It's only if and when the full parameters are overridden. Okay, so that's important to know as well. Um, release on next go is a dangerous one. Um, use that with care. What that literally means is that when I press any cue list and press go, it stops the given cue list that we've set release on next go on. So it, it does exactly what it says. The next time you hit go, doesn't matter where it is on the console, this cue list will release the next time. So use that one with care. Um, fader options, we have HTP dimmer levels. So that means between different queue lists, it will actually allow you to control the dimmers in, in a highest takes precedence fashion where um, they're like submasters in a sense, but they're holding all the parameters in the queue like normal. And then zero fade is just a quick, easy way to literally disable all the fade times um, in there. Then um, go exit link. Gonna have to remember super quick what that one is. Um, so if you, okay, yeah, that's right. If you go in the queue list options and you're linking queues together, so three goes to, you know, Q1 goes to Q2, goes to Q3, goes to Q1, uh, and there's a fourth queue in that queue list maybe, that will allow you that if you're stuck in a loop, it'll allow you to hit go, and then that's going to exit a, that's going to allow you to exit that circle that you found yourself in. Uh, startup settings, these are great. Um, there's the defaults or you can turn that off. So by default, of course, there's a default in the main menu settings. Uh, it's gonna be that all faders start at full when you boot up the console. If you would like it to be different, you can set that level um, by typing and pressing set. You can press get current. So here I'm on fader four. So I take that and I move it to about 50% and I press get current and it captures that. And then there's auto start at boot. So by default, when you open up Onyx, um, you start with a blank slate, just like you went and you snap released everything and you did a clear all. Okay, you start in the dark. But especially with installed venues, things like that, I like to have something auto start at boot so that it logs in, somebody starts up Onyx, and then some lights automatically come on. And making this option active will do exactly that. Awesome. Next, we have MIDI show control out. Um, so this is if you are using MIDI show control devices. I don't think it's that common anymore. Um, but if you are, it does allow you to send MIDI show control to other devices and that can allow things to be triggered um, in an automated fashion through MIDI show control, which is a little bit different 
from um, MIDI timecode or MIDI notes. We're going to talk about that a little deeper later in today's webinar. Um, for the most part today, unless Matisse or Bob jump in and tell me that I'm terribly wrong, I don't see MIDI show control used a lot. Um, it's in very niche circumstances, um, sometimes with theme parks or television or something like that, but it's not terribly common anymore. Uh, the last option we do have here is the end of queue list. So what do you do when you hit the end of the queue list? Um, by default, it's just going to wrap around to the first queue. But you've got other options here. You can have it literally stop, just go no further after the last queue, release. So you hit that last queue, say you've got five queues, you know, play one, two, three, four, five. You're in five, you hit go, and then it releases or auto release, which uh, means you hit that queue. Oops and then it waits a second and then it releases. So all options there, things you can do, etc. Now there's gonna be different options in here for different types of queue lists, um, but what remains the same, and we'll go over those in a second, is the function assignments tab. So this allows you to set the action of the various buttons that you may have. Now, for example, again, I'm on an NX wing today, and so if you're on one of the consoles, you're gonna have button, button, fader, button, button. If you're on say an NX touch, then you have, let me look at mine quick. You have button, butter, button, 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 fader, button. So you skip this one in the middle. Uh, and so these, these actions here are completely customizable. You may notice if you have any of the consoles that the buttons aren't labeled with go and pause and things like that. And that just makes it so that um, your keys don't get all sticky with tape if you change them and then need to remember what the buttons do. And so you can select a drop down from any of these. There are a lot of really cool options um, to be able to set these. Um, for example, a lot of times instead of pause and back, I'll do release on that button on the second button so that if I need to release, I can. Um, there's also a down option up, down option, excuse me, and an up action. What in the world is that? Well, by default, up does nothing, but you can have it do any variety of things. Uh, pause back, go back and release. And so that's literally, that's when you let go of the key. Okay, so that's when you're pressing it, it goes, just did, and then you let go what happens next. And so you could have it release there. So I could go ahead and uh, let me just release this cue list real quick. With a lot of these options, um, it does want you to release. And now I actually have to hold it to get it to come in. And then when I let go, it releases. So like a second ago, I just tapped it to go and you see it dumps right away. Um, so that's an option there, especially like the go release gives you basically a button you have to hold to do whatever you're doing. You know, everything's strobing maybe. And then you let go and it's gonna release that of course, the default release time is three seconds, but you can change that. Uh, on the fader action, you have the ability to set it LTP, latest takes precedence, HTP. You can crossfade, so that's going to be between Q1 and Q2 to have that crossfade. Um, and then there's also the up and going down and release. So that's one I personally use it a lot, where um, you start to bring the fader up. And once you get past 5%, I'm at 5% right now, and then I push the fader up higher, the queue automatically goes. It plays the first queue. Uh, you can customize that level to whatever you want. Just the basic gist there is that it's it, in case you bump the fader a little, you don't want to fire a queue accidentally. Um, and then when you bring it down, it's going to release that queue. So, so it's completely free. Um, it is, as you notice, when you hit that 5% and it starts fading in, it's still going to obey the fade time. So that's just when it initiates the start of that queue coming in. Of course, you can set to zero fade, uh, your fade times, and then you would have complete control via the fader. But I find the fade time does soften things. Um, and so depending on what you're doing, you probably, you may or may not keep that fade time. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Then we have uh, no most notably, um, push to all is, is only for, when you have this queue list on multiple playbacks. Um, but use velocity as flash value is available is something that's there for the M-Touch and NX-Touch. 
Um, and so if you turn that on, I don't have my NX Touch connected right now, but if you do turn that on, and then uh, you have a flash button defined, you can then use your flash button, use the velocity, how hard you press the flash button on the NX Touch will determine how high the light flashes. It's pretty cool. I, th I think it's fun. Um, definitely not for every application, but it is cool. Now, one thing that is uh, that you are able to do is this timed column here. So this timed column uh, deals with the flash timings on the next the next tab over. And when we turn on the timed column, you have to turn that on. That's very important. I'll turn my cue off here. Uh, what that does by default is it has no time. And so if I hit the flash key, you're gonna see there. Should flash, oh, I don't know if I have intensity. No, I do have intensity. Why is it not flashing? I'm not sure, wrong button maybe. Um, either way, um, the timed option allows you to actually set a timing on that flash here. And so that's in seconds. You see, as I drag that fader up uh, with my finger or with the mouse, you can have an attack, you can have a hold. So how quickly it, it, it fades up that flash, how long it holds on the flash, even if you let go of the button, and then what the decay is, how long it, it decays down. So that as that flash happens, um, you are able to kind of simulate like an incandescent light, right? With, with LEDs, you're able to do that if desired there. And I get a little bit more of a natural flashing, more like an incandescent light there. Um, so that can be really useful as well. Awesome. Next, we have uh, info. So info just tells you where this fader is. Uh, if it's on faders, if it's on buttons, where's that cue list? Uh, you can hit refresh if you just moved it somewhere and it's going gonna, it's gonna to populate that there. So if you have a particular cue list that's on a bunch of faders, it's going to tell you there. Awesome. Next, we've got time code. So time code cue list, uh, I've got um, written down to go over that in a in a few minutes, but uh, but it allows you. It's just like a regular cue list. In fact, it has many of the same options, but it listens to time code, so that you can play an automated music track or a video file that is generating time code and keep the lights perfectly in sync. Uh, on the settings level, the only thing that's really different is the TC sync right here. And that just says accept cue list time range only. So that locks it in to only pay attention uh, to the cue, the range of time that's in the cue list. Um, and so that is there as well. Chase, however, has some chase options here. As you probably notice here as we switch between them, it's pretty uh, common that, you know, here in the right is where we get a different section that gives us the options that are particular to that cue list type. So that's where you can look out for that you can see that all of the rest is um, is right there. And so, and so that is there. Um, for chase options, there's the options to use the timing and global rate. So that's related to the BPM right here that you can tap. Um, but if you do not have those toggled on, the uh, use timing allows you to tap the tempo. The global rate allows you to do it from the, the master BPM. Um, if you don't use either one or both of those, you can set the timing in directly. So you can type in your BPM. Oops. So you click in there so it turns red. You can type a manual BPM. It shows you what the seconds are as well of that BPM. You can see it changing there. And then we also have the fade percent. So by default, actually, I'll go back to this move in black demo and make it a chase, because why not? Um, by default, you can see here the fade percentage is 100%. And so those chases, all those cues are fading between each other. Um, now, what you can do is if you set a fade percentage that's different, like we'll just go down to zero, for example, now the cues literally don't fade. They just jump between the uh, different options here. If we go to say 
now we get somewhat of a fade, but it's a little jumpy, right? It's, it's, it fades about 50% of the time and then it pauses the other 50%. That's the best way to think of it is it does its fade. Basically it's got, it's at 80 BPM right now. So it's three quarters of a second. Half of that time is spent fading. The other half is sat pause there. Whereas a hundred percent, you know, it's gone. It's fading all the time. Uh, the fade forward, backward, um, bounce and random are how it goes through the cues. So as an example, if I set that to random and make it go, now it's just jumping around randomly wherever it wants. You know, two, three, two, one, three, four, one, three. So it's just jumping five. Now it's just jumping randomly through the cues. Um, forward is forward, backward is backwards through the numbering of the cues. Bounce goes forward to the end, then ping pongs back again. And then random, of course, is random. Tap sync options. Um, you can just go with the show default, which would be in the main menu. Um, or you can enable tap sync individually of this cue list uh, via the top button or and, and storing that info. Um, you can enable disable or just stick with the show defaults there. Um, I saw a great question come in, which definitely applies to this. Um, so can a button be programmed on the NX wing for tap sync? And that's a great question that directly applies to what we're doing here. Um, and yeah, you can use the function keys. So if I unlock my workspace and this will work on the PC, on any of these sidebars or on a function key. So I'm just gonna press edit, press a function key. Now I'm brought to that function key here and I can go to, it's in here, it's in one of these. Yeah, playback control beat. And there you go. And so now that's the, that's the beat button, which of course I put it on an F key. So if I tap that, we see the BPM going through the roof there. So I tap it, now slow it back down. So you can totally put that on an F key. Uh, we went over that in the last webinar. So the intermediate, so you can check that out there, how to do sidebar buttons or F keys. Uh, it's the same process, just a uh, different real estate. Um, absolutely, very cool. And so that is the basic of the chase. I think we covered everything in there. Yep, very cool. Submaster is next. We can see here that the options are very different for Submaster um, because a Submaster, as we went over in the last webinar, is only intensity. So it only covers the intensity level, okay? And so what it's going to do then is um, basically uh, only, you know, it's highest takes precedence between multiple, um, multiple submasters. So if you have the same light on two submasters, whichever one is higher is gonna win the output. Um, but then if you drop that down, it will, it will um, be the lower one will have that ability. Actually, we'll demo that quick. Um, but the options here, just to go over those, are um, there's overridable by programmer. So if we turn this off, literally the programmer can't set the light to a higher value. Um, ignore bank change release. So if you have things set up to release, I think it's in the, the main menu, uh, your banks when you change them, or you're doing it via a macro, which we'll talk about later, uh, you can ignore that. Uh, Submaster is swappable as well. So swap is a button that you can actually set here, S-W-O-P. And what swap stands for, I know it's a funny word, um, is basically it's like a solo where you press it and it flashes. Um, and it also, um, it brings the, the fader to full or the Submaster. And it also uh, solos it. So like everything else turns off. Um, that wouldn't be parked or otherwise. And so it allows you to do that. And then there's the same startup setting. So let's do a quick uh, submaster demo. Actually, I'm gonna change this one from a submaster because it doesn't make sense as a submaster. And I'm gonna take my fuse washes here, take them to full. And I'm gonna record that to a submaster. And then I'm gonna take them to, I'm going to actually go ahead and take just the center couple. Open oh, these are, let's see, right there. Those two, those four. We'll take those to full, okay? 
we'll record those as another sub. And so now we're gonna go ahead and uh, clear this out. And when I bring up the first, I get all eight of those. Let me actually just pull them into my programmer real quick and tilt them forward. Other way. So then when we bring up the first submaster, we get all eight of them. The second, we get all four. But we'll notice if we bring up the, if we have the second up part way and bring up the first, it brings them up to full all the way. But then as we bring it down, we don't lose the second one. Okay, and that's basically how submasters and highest text precedent work is if you have it riding there as a, at a low level, it's always gonna be there. It's, it's never gonna go away. It's never gonna get released. Um, it's always, as long as it's higher than something, than, you know, whatever other values being played, you're gonna see output from that fader. But if you take a fader and bring it above that level, you're going to see an increase in level, even if two lights on, on faders have the same level. Whereas if we did this with Qlist um, and I had this one with my four in the center, and then I brought up this one with all my lights, it would override that Qlist. And then when I pulled it back down, um, they would all go out. Or if I had this one up, the first one with all the lights, and then I brought the second one up as a Qlist and then I brought it down, it would subtract um, those lights those four lights. And so submasters are a little different. They're purely additive, purely HTP, and uh, definitely can work great. Awesome. Similar to the submaster is our next type, the inhibitive. Okay. And so inhibitives work great. And I'll set this one to a regular Q list for this example, and this guy to an inhibitive. So what inhibitives do? is as it tells you it is a subtractive fader which will be the result as it says of the proportional value of the q so just as an example i took the center four lights and i've now turned this fader with the, them on it to an inhibitive okay and that means that if i have that fader down they're off there's no output I have to bring that fader up to get output. They are subtractive. It also means that um, being proportional, that if I set that inhibitive to 80% and I bring that up all the way, the maximum that I'm gonna get out of those lights is 80%, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get any more out of them um, because that inhibitive is set to a max of 80. And then as I bring it down, it's gonna be proportional. So the way that I like to use these a lot in shows, especially um, with cameras, are for backlight or things like that, where on the fly, I might want to subtract some of that out of there, right? For some speakers on stage, some people that are up there, I'm gonna want it at full. That's gonna look great with the clothes they're wearing, their skin tone, et cetera. Um, that's gonna create the proper backlight. But then somebody else might step up and it might be a little bit harsh. It might catch their hair a ton if they have big hair, um, you know, et cetera. Unlike if Bob Mantel jumps up there. You know, it might catch his hair and make him look like his, his hair's all crazy. Um, whereas, you know, we get a bald guy up there like Matias, see, we got great people here for this. Um, they might need a little more backlight to stand around from the background. And so we can ride that inhibitive up and down. You know, we're, we're keeping it a little lower for Bob, keeping it all the way up uh, for Matias. And we're able to not mess with our cue, not mess with the level set in our cue, but just on the fly, modify what we've got there with an inhibitive. Um, another great example of inhibitives are uh, with intensity of light that you might run intensity effects on. And so the benefit of over a submaster is just that if I'm running an effect on a light and I wanna control the amount of that intensity, maybe I'm running the effect off a button instead of a fader, um, I can still control the intensity of that effect overall by pulling down that inhibitive. Um, whereas the submaster would still allow that effect to come through. So it's really, you know, when you talk about submasters versus inhibitives and what you do when and, and how to do it, it's really one of those things to feel out for yourself. Uh, some people really do use a lot of submasters and that works well for them. I like to use a lot of inhibitives, but it's purely stylistic. 
Um, and there's different times for different both. There is a season for everything, turn, 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 um, et cetera. Last but not least, we have the override with the infamous Q blender within it. We're gonna talk about those here. Let me grab a quick sip of tea here. Awesome. So the override is a different type of fader than uh, what we've worked through previously. We can see here, this one is, if I turn this other cue off, this guy here is just intensity. And if I bring it up and down, it works just like a cue list. It works just like a submaster. Things kind of look exactly the same as what we had before, but they're not. So in the override settings, first and foremost, um, the only setting we have here that's special is the Q Blender toggle that turns the Q Blender on and off. Everything else is the same. Um, the difference being that overrides, uh, much like, I know not like chases, I think it's just overrides, start at 0%, um, maybe submasters too. Yeah, submasters and overrides um, and inhibitives start at, no, it's just submasters and overrides. Yeah, that's what I thought. Start at 0%. I shouldn't second guess myself, I knew that. Um, they start at 0%. Everything else by default, the fader levels are full. Okay. Other than that, um, the Q Blender is really the only option we have in here. But before we get to the Q Blender, let's dive in a little bit to what the inhibitive is so you can see that. So I'm going to delete some stuff here. Just so I have a little bit of extra room. Cool. So what the Q Blender or what the override does that's special is it fades all parameters, okay? So if I take these spots, let's say, well, we'll use the darts now. We haven't used them in a while. We pop them up to full. We go ahead and we point them somewhere. Ooh, I wonder if something's funky with my patch. For some reason, that universe isn't coming through. Okay, no worries there. We'll just use the fuse washes. They were working the other day. Hmm. Figure that out. So turn those guys on. We point them up in the air. Actually, we'll start down low. We record that. Actually, we're doing an override first. We'll, for the Q Blender, we'll do that. But for this, we'll actually take them all the way to full. And uh, maybe this way, we can't decide. And record that as an override. And when we clear that, we can see, as we bring that up, not only is the intensity coming up, but also the tilt. And so that's the super powerful thing about the overrides, is every parameter that you place on an override, whether that be the regular parameters, effects, you know, pan tilt, color, Everything gets controlled by that override. Everything gets faded in and out as you move the fader up and down. Okay, so here we did it with pan and tilt, but we could also, in another example, grab those same lights, apply a color to them. And at default, the, the RGBWs add to full white, but then we go to red here. So we could record that as a second override. And then we can see that overrides work great on color too. So as I bring that fader up and down, I get that control over the color. As I bring this one up and down, I get that control over the pan tilt. If I work with them together, figures four and five over here on the, on the wing, I can now move those around, place them anywhere among the path of the fader that I desire and get that complete control, be able to fade them in and out, get any percentage of either of them that I so desire as such and get that control. So those are overrides on their own. They're cool. They can do a lot of great stuff, but the Q Blender functionality is where they, they really shine. Okay. Um, that's where they really are very cool. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and um, 
And first note, with the overrides, there's no tracking within the, the override. So that's important. But let's go ahead and build like a little flyout. Okay. So I take my, my Fuse SFX and I take them to full and I point them straight down. So I'm just going to leave them where they were. I record that to my first queue on this override. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to record a second queue, but I'm going to tilt them up into the sky. By the time we get up in the sky, we'll take them nice and blue. And then I'm going to record this. Now, tracking is not enabled on, on queue blenders. It doesn't track between queues. And so I can either touch all the parameters that I touched in the first queue. I could have adjusted intensity, just back up to 100%. Or I can choose source active plus inactive uh, to be able to get those values that I recorded in the previous queue. They were still in the programmer, but they're not active because uh, they were recorded previous. And put this on this same queue. And then maybe as a third queue, just for fun, we'll then take them to zero. And leave them in the color they're at. This time, I'll just touch the pan and tilt so it turns red. They're loaded. I could also hold load, press the parameter. There's a few ways to do it as we went over in the last webinar. And then we can go ahead and record that third queue. Now, I touched all the parameters this time. Instead of pressing active and inactive, both are valid approaches in this case. And then I'm going to clear. Then I write, I go into the settings here. So tap on this guy, hit the settings, or right click on a PC. Turn on that cube blender. And now, as we move the fader up from zero up to 50%, it goes from Q1 to Q2. Okay. Then about 50% to full, it goes Q2 to Q3. And so along that fader's path, as I move it, that's a little jumpy on the screen, but on the physical fader, I can show you. It's nice and smooth. I can fly out, then I can shut off. Okay, then I could clear it or whatever I want to do. So I could fly out at the end of that song, get complete control, um, be able to stop anywhere in the middle and get that control via the, the cue blender. Now for this particular example, I'm gonna go to the cue list values, pop into edit mode, and in this little tab here, there's this from and to, and this allows me to adjust the fading between the different cues throughout the length of the fader. As you can probably see, it's percentage based. So 100% is the top. And so in this example, I'm just going to go, let's see, first cue is zero to maybe 60. You see it's red there because it's telling me that they're overlapping and that's great. Second queue is now 60 and it's going to go to 95. Third queue is going to be 95 to 100. And now as I bring that guy up, we now see as I bring that fader up, it's low. Now I'm almost at the top of the fader. Boom, I've kind of got my, my hang on the fly out. You know, they just finished the song. Then I've got my out at the very top. And then I can I can drop it or I can release it or whatever. Um, I could put a release key on there and that would allow me to, to release it, et cetera. Let me just resize this a little. So cube blenders are very, very cool in that regard. Um, here's another example. We haven't really uh, done effects yet, but one thing I can do as an example here is pop over here to the fixtures. And I know my Z350s, we've got the four more up front here, and then we've got four that are more in the back. So I'm just gonna grab the back four. And actually, let me just grab all of them super quick, put them on a submaster so that intensity is not part of this one. Just turn those guys on so that they're stuck on for me. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab my back four units. 
tilt them. Just leave this up for a minute. Tilt them forward. Maybe for our first cue, I'm going to just do active and inactive preemptively and hit the star to save it. Call it an override. Then our second cue, I'm going to kick these up higher and I'm going to take group two, bring them to full and bring them, bring them up a little. Record that as the second cue. Bring up the second group further, bring up the first group even further, all the way up to the sky. Record that as a third cue. So now I have not only, and we did keep our filter active, yeah. We have not only like a, a fly out, but it also builds among the fader, which is really cool. I used to do this with blinders a lot when we had um, like, you know, regular blinders that went on the dimmer. Um, non moving, turn on the cue blender here. Very important step. And so there it's like, okay, if I just want to flash into the audience a little with a blinder, I just bring this up a little. Then as I move that up, my second comes in. And now I'm flashing the audience with two sets and then last three sets at the top. And so you can see how you get some really awesome control. You're able to basically, with a lot of things, um, put more than two playbacks worth of, of stuff on a single fader, um, which is super cool. And so, and so when I would do a build like this with some blinders on other consoles previously, you know, working for a production company or whatnot um, that had other consoles, I would go ahead, if I wanted to do a stack with the blinders where I stacked two sets of blinders like this or some movers that came in, this would be two faders, right? It would be one fader for the back four and then the, the mid four that are up front more, that would be a whole second fader. And I would have to use those two faders independently um, and, and, and mix them together. And really it would take two hands to do that. Whereas here, it's all in one hand, it saves a fader. You can do even more. But there's even more that you can do um, within here. And so say for an example, we haven't gone over effects yet and we're gonna go over them uh, next in this webinar. But say I go ahead and I, I build some effects. So one thing that I like to do is just grab, I'll use these Z350s because they're on a Submaster. Is say I'm doing a show and I just wanna have a bunch of effects at hands and I'm kind of short on fader. So I want a bunch of position effects. I want control over them, um, but I don't have a lot of space for them. Well, I can literally just go and, you know, go in here to the effects program, choose a, uh, a, pa a ballyhoo. Actually, I'll just make my own. So I'll swing on the pan a little, swing on the tilt, much more. Turn this on. We'll go over this in a minute. Make it look nice. Yay. Record that on an override. Then maybe I have a second one where I change the effects timing and also the shape. I speed it up a little. I record, I've still got my starred active and inactive. So that's not the default settings because they are not tracking in, in Cube Blenders. And then maybe I speed it up a little. I go a little more nuts for a third one. to my timing, set a number that doesn't divide well, so it looks super random. Record that as a third effect. Clear that guy out, right click, Cube Blender, under advanced, same, same process. And this time, I've got a really cool stack of effects where I can bring it up a little and it works a lot better on the physical theater than on the screen. I'll bring it up a little and I get kind of a small belly who type effect. I bring it up more. Now the effect changes a little bit, but it's a much larger effect. I push it up more. I'm going to get an effect that's much wider and faster. I push it up all the way. It goes crazy. And so within 
this fader within these three different values I have, with the fact that the effect is controlling, the speed of the effect is being controlled by the override, the size, and we're also fading between three different cues as a cue blender, means that in one fader on a given show, I've got like six different looking unique ballyhoos, different looking um, effects here that are all just on one fader that I can jump through and change at will. Music slows down, I can slow it down. Music speeds up or goes crazy, I can go crazy. I can pull it down to be done. And all of these, I'm just moving the fader up and down with my finger. I'm not having to press go. I'm not having to find the cue list that has the faster one and the slower one. It, it's all right here. It's all in one cue list. And so that's one of the really cool things about cue blenders is you can go ahead and, and really stack some stuff up um, and really save a lot of faders and get a lot more functionality. So your, your 10 faders in Onyx are maybe equal to more than uh, 10 faders in other consoles when you consider that you're stacking multiple queues up, you're getting that fader base control of the override, and then you're stacking multiple queues on top of it. Um, it's really, really powerful. And so um, you definitely want to spend some time, you know, working with some different queue blenders. There's so much that, that they can do. Um, and if we have time at the end, I could go through a couple more examples, but I don't want to run out of time, uh, seeing as we're about seven minutes to two o'clock, and then at three o'clock, I'm in central time, uh, is our, our wrap. And I want to, there's, there's some other stuff I want to cover here that are very important. So effects, good stuff here. I'm just going to look over the questions that the guys have left in here super quick for me while I take a quick, um, a quick tea drink. So the fader doesn't affect the intensity if the cue blender is activated. Um, yes and no. So in this particular example, I wasn't recording intensity to the cue blender. That's a great question for this, by the way. Um, and if I were including intensity in the cue blender, it would be affected. But if the intensity came up to full in the first cue on that cue blender, um, then what would happen is it would come up to full in that fader range up to the first queue, if that's 33 or 50% or what, whatever it's set to. Um, and so it still controls it, but in this example, I just didn't touch intensity. I kept it on this submaster on the side. Um, and so it was totally separate, but it's gonna fade all parameters, intensity, color, pan tilt, everything. Okay. All right, I think that's all we had on, on the override. So that's great. There are a few other questions. We'll, we'll hopefully, we should have time for some general questions at the end. But I wanna talk about effects because I know if I had questions about effects, I know folks uh, want at least an introduction on effects, if not more. Um, and so what we're gonna do here is go through a brief introduction on how the effects work. And then we're gonna go through a couple examples and then at the end, we should have some time for questions as well. So I'm gonna go ahead once again and clear stuff out of the way as we so do here. Oh, I know I could go to a new bank. But um, actually, I'll do that. So I've got this submaster up, and I'm just going to copy that. So copy submaster, go to bank two. Now we're fresh in a fresh new bank here. Um, by the way, to switch banks, you can click up here, switching those banks. You can also drag side to side. Works great on touch screen. Very cool. Very cool. So what we want to do here is build our first effect. So there, there are a few different views. You can build effects in any view. You can build it in the regular fixture presets window. Um, you can build it in the effects program, which when we talk about effects link in a minute, will definitely be in here. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna start in the regular window. I'm gonna grab my Fuse Wash Z350s because they're on and easy to work with. I'm gonna turn off my Submaster because I wanna work with intensity. And then what I'm gonna do is go to intensity set a level for it. I'll start them in the center 50% and then go over to effects. So if you were on our last webinar, you'll remember that our regular parameters are here. And when we want to apply fanning or grouping or effects to them, we make sure we've last touched or selected the parameter that we want to work with. And then we go ahead over to effects. Okay. And so, um, 
what we do here then is uh, is we now have effects swing. That's how far the effect moves off of its base, which is 50% here. And we can see that visualized if we pop out this little effects graph, we can see this visualized. So right now the effect is doing nothing, but we could set a swing. How far off of that base do we wanna go? We'll start with 100% here. So that means this effect is gonna go from its base point in the center at 50%. It's gonna go all the way up to 100. It's gonna go all the way down to zero. It's not going to exceed either of those, which is where you would see a pause basically in the effect. Um, and then you'd be, and then it would keep going. Um, so that's the swing. Then we have the speed is how fast does it go? That's pretty obvious. Um, speed is how quick things go. And so now we see, okay, those lights all, I'm just gonna tilt them a little. Awesome. So you can see those lights are turning on and off, back to intensity and then to effects. Then we have the mode. So the mode has the base as the black line, and then it shows the curve that the lights will follow. So the default is a sine wave, but we could do like an additive only. We could do like a subtractive only. We could do a chasing type mode, okay? We're gonna stick with the regular sine wave here. And then we have a multiplier, which is just a speed multiplier. It allows you to take, uh, you know, this effect that's at 40% and you could double the rate with that multiplier. Um, if you needed to, you can go way crazy fast as well. Um, but of course, if you start going faster than the light can actually perform, especially with things that move, like pan tilt, color wheels, you know, gobos, things that physically move, you can exceed the speed and then you start to lose um, swing actually in the physical unit. It's not going to swing as far because before it gets to where it's going, it's going to have to go somewhere else. Um, so you can just watch that speed. If you start to go too fast, you may see that. Um, so we've got swing speed mode and multiplier. It's looking pretty nice. Okay, the lights are turning on and off. But then we want to go to effects timing. And effects timing, if we set our wave right here to eight, evenly spreads that chase across these eight lights. We can see it there, okay? Um, step, if I set that to eight, is a separate type of timing where each of the eight lights does the effect and then the next light takes over and it goes. So more often than not, I use wave, but step can be used for those chasing type effects. Uh, since we have eight lights here, if we set it to eight, like I mentioned, it spreads that effects waveform across all eight lights in the order that we selected them. If I set that like to four, then you see it repeats every four lights, which with these four lights in two nice rows, thanks to Mr. Mendel, we see that happening in sync um, between the two rows when we set that to four. Once we see what we like, maybe we set it to five so it's offset. We like four. We'll go ahead and record that. I'm going to set my uh, settings back to normal with source just being active. Not that it matters at the moment because I cleared since I last recorded. And we're going to save that as an override intensity effect. Cool, we'll clear that out. We see on the override, we get that effects control. over those lights. Now we go ahead, let's do a, a quick pan tilt effect. So as before, we go to pan tilt, then we go to effects. Actually, quickly, I'm gonna go find Bob's hazer and turn it on. So it's a little more easy to see. Oh, where did it go? Did I lose it somehow? What's the fixture number on that? That would be fixture 201 if you left it. How did I lose it? Somehow I lost oh, it. Wow. Oops. You deleted oh, well. it. That's okay. No worries. Um, I usually just leave the capture one alone myself, but that's okay. Um, so back to where we were. Oh, yes. Select some lights. So we'll select our group again. Now, when we go to pan tilt and then to effects, we get pan and tilt together. Now that's the default, but if you do want to work with pan and tilt separately, just hit this cog, go to pan tilt combo, do to do, which is hello, where'd it go? Where'd it go? 
It's hiding from me. There used to be a pan tilt combo in here. Where'd it go? Who knows? So there should be a pan tilt combo in here. I don't know where in the world it went. It disappeared lately. Um, but that's okay. So now I just swing pan to whatever rate I want, swing tilt to whatever rate I want. This is going to be a very tilt heavy effect. Turn on my submaster so I can see what in the world is going on. And we'll do just a little bit more pan. We also see it visualized in this little window here, as well as the, uh, the larger window that I've popped out. Now with pan and tilt, this figure is similar to the mode, but a little bit different because the mode is technically accessible in the bottom. Um, but we can set those modes. There's all sorts of different ones, such as circles, figure eights, et cetera. You saw me going through these a second ago. And then of course, timing is always important. When I do a nice ballyhoo like this, I like to use a number that doesn't isn't divisible by the total number of fixtures. Um, and so that way, you know, I, I choose five out of eight here. It's not going to be even, it's gonna be kind of random looking, um, kind of, you know, off center, but you can totally make them very even, you know, using something like four, they all match the one behind them or eight, as we noted, it spreads across evenly. You can do what you, Desire, playing around is always the best concept. So then we can record that. Pan tilt effects. Awesome. So then we have a pan tilt effect, a intensity effect. We'll quickly do a color effect. It's gonna work the same way with color, choosing color and then going to effects. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to go and I'm going to go to the effects program window where I can select my washes. And then down here we have effects macros. So this is a, a recorded effects setting for one fixture, for the last fixture. So what that looks like is if we apply, say, magenta white step here, we get our magenta white. Should see our magenta white. Oh, I wonder why there's no swing and speed. Either way, we see our magenta white here. Oh, maybe it's not happy on an RGB fixture. Whoop. Should be, but either way, we can grab our spots here, pop them to full, do a magenta white step. And nothing like an example you've used for years when you're in a beta version and something. Do I have highlight on? No, I don't have highlight on. Hmm. Why that's working, I'm not sure. I got to put in smoke liquid. <laughs> that's okay. Go ahead. I'm not sure why I'm not seeing that because normally you would. So we'll just choose a movement one. Go back here to our washes. Why these color ones are not presently working. Let me turn the link off. Turn on magenta white, turn link back on. Should be working. Okay, that's okay. We'll go ahead and make our color effect on our own. Those have worked in the past. I wonder if we found something or if I'm just brain dead. Um, and so we'll just go to color. Now we have here, I'll turn my link back off. Red, green, blue, and white control. So maybe I go ahead and I turn red on to full. I turn blue on. And then I run an effect on blue. Set that swing to maximum, set our speed. This one I'll choose just a chasing shape. And then turn on wave. That looks nice. It's jumping through them real nice. Record those guys. Boom. And now we have three types of effects. And this is where the override really comes in helpful, really comes in handy because we can bring up just intensity. And if we turn off our submaster, we get just that intensity effect. If we turn on pan tilt, we can add the pan tilt effect. And now they're both running. We add color. We've now added a color effect into the mix. We can run all three of them at full. We can run all three of them less. We can run them one at a time. Even with intensity, we could bring our submaster up to like 
and then it's just running that chase from 50 to 100, right? We can go ahead and we can move this up and down, the intensity effect, which apparently is a position on it, oops, and it's gonna only do the intensity effect from 50 to 100. And you can see as we mix these together, that you really get a really great ability to, with just even three, four faders of effects, make 12 or 15 unique looking things. Not only that, you see as we move the faders, like for this pan tilt effect, or if we move the color effect fader, when we move it down, it not only modifies the size of that effect, but also the speed of the effect. So when it's down, it's a lot slower. For example, one of the questions that came in was about effect speed faders. Effect speed faders are great. And honestly, whenever I'm lighting music, it's the first thing I create before I build any other effects. And what they allow you to do is use an override to actually control your speed. Okay, and it's something I do, once again, on every show. Okay, I see, oh, for mentioning there that uh, some of these are known issues. Uh, Good deal, because yeah, you pull an example you've used for years, you read the release notes, you're like, I don't see anything there for that. And uh, yeah, no worries. Um, that's why it's a beta. So what we can do is set an effects speed fader. And so if we grab our fuse washes, we grab all our lights, what I like to do at the top of a show when I'm just first starting is I turn on effects link, we'll go over effects link in a minute, and I select everything just everything, because I'm going to use an effect on everything. Now I can do it like this. I can also hit select all here at the top. Okay. And then once I've got everything selected, I go in here to say intensity, doesn't matter, and speed. And it says here, speed on multiple channels. Great. I set that to 40% or whatever the fastest I'm going to want is. Okay. Um, you really do want to set that to your maximum speed. Um, but there's no need, if you set it above the maximum speed you'll ever need, then you're just wasting fader resolution at the top, right? If you're never going to go there, um, there's no point in having it there. And so now in my programmer, all I have, and this is just for the fuse washes, but I, I would do it for all my lights, is I have an effects speed set for every parameter that this light can do. And so I do this before I make any effects. I record that to an override. I give it a great name such as effects speed. And then I bring it up to full, okay? And I clear, or maybe I bring it up to 50%. Now what that fader does is you can see if there's a, an effects running that has speed, it's gonna override that speed. But most often, if I'm lighting a band, when I build my effects, I'm not gonna build any speed into them, okay? So an example of that would be, I grab my good old uh, fuse washes, and I run an effect on them. So we just go back. Maybe we rebuild our nice uh, red green. You got to turn link off, by the way, to work with things individually. Well, let's do a red to yellow chase. We set, oops, I got to clear, right click and clear. I didn't mean to set a speed. So in this case, I'm literally just setting a swing on these lights. I'm not, I'm not setting a speed. I can set a mode to whatever I need. I can set effects timing. We'll do four on this one. I like the way Bob laid this out. And we can record that. So this can be effects without speed. And I would normally record all my effects when I'm lighting a band like this without speed. Because then, as long as I have my effects speed up, I'll bring it down for a second. If I bring the fader up without effects speed, yeah, nothing really happens. I get that red in, nothing else but I'm always gonna keep that fader up so that that effects speed fader always has control over all the effects, okay? So if I take these guys, I'll just tilt them forward a little bit so we can see those guys a little better. And then I go ahead and I can modify this effect speed. I can stop the effect, I can bring the speed up. I can stop, you know, if the music stops, bring it up. You know, if it's, uh, what is that uh, game, uh, not, uh, not a uh, cakewalk, but uh, all of the kids play. Is it Duck, Duck, Goose? You know, the music's playing. When the music stops, you sit, it's blank, and that's okay. You know, if you're playing that with the band, <laughs> you've got the effect running. 
and then you can stop it. And this will, this fader will only control speed. If you want to actually stop the effect, you don't want the effect to play anymore, then yeah, you want to bring the effect down all the way because that's going to bring the effect out. But you can modify the speed of all the effects with this effect speed fader. And it's always going to have that control as long as you don't put the speed in the effects. Like I mentioned, even if you do put the speed in the effects, like I did here, then the speed fader will still take control. Okay, so we get up there, you see it's moving faster. Now it's moving slower. The one kind of kink in that, that plan is just when I have this, feed, this speed fader real low, it took control, I bring it down real low and they slow down for a minute, um, but it's not too bad. It can work to speed it up, but then I can't slow it down slower than it was already set it. Now, granted, that's the moment where you go over here to rate, and we talked about this in the last webinar, and there is a global effect speed where if you didn't create a speed fader from the get-go or you don't wanna recreate some of your effects or remove values, you can just modify the percentage that the effects are running at um, using this guy as well. But I like to make a speed fader. I know somebody asked about that, and that's a very popular thing as well. Um, but let's talk about effects link. I'll keep my, I'll actually, no, turn off for speed fader for this one. So effects link is, and by the way, noting that that color thing was a bug with the macros, um, the way that I did show you to do them will work. I'm <laughs> just not in this beta, but it's a known bug. And so, um, and so yeah, that's, that's just one of the things you run into sometimes. Um, but let's talk about effects link. So effects link might be this funny thing that you see in the effects program window on the side here. Um, it might also be a button that you see on your control surface that says link. And you say, hey, does that call the, the uh, hero from, oh, what was that game? Zelda, um, when we were kids, did that call that hero? No, um, but it does allow you to do some cool things with effects. So you may have noticed like when I hit the fuse wash and went into a color macro, yeah, the color macros didn't work, but effects link did turn on. And that's because anytime we want to work inside Onyx, I'm just gonna turn link off for a second. Anytime we want to work within Onyx with multiple parameters. So we're working with, um, you know, pan and tilt as well as intensity. That's a good example. Or color as well as intensity or something like that. And we want to create an effect. And then as we're modifying that effect, we want to change the speed and have them stay in sync. That's where effects link comes in. Not only when we're setting that speed and we want to stay in sync, but also when we're working with the effects timing. Um, and we want them to apply to both those effects. Hitting effects link is going to allow us to do that. Let me do a demo. So here we've got our fuse washes and say we take them to 50. And then we go ahead and do an intensity effect. So intensity effects, swing speed, speed to 45. You need to remember what you set your speed to. Timing, we'll just do the eight on these. We got a nice effect. Then we go to pan tilt, we go to effects, we build a tilt effect that we like. Set that speed to 40. We dial in something that we like. Yeah, it's not art, but it's okay. We tilt it up a little higher to look better. Other way, David. something like that. And then we also set an effects timing of eight on these guys. Now, if we go ahead and turn on link in the button, the effects link button here, here on your console, um, you know, in your back pocket, wherever you have it, then we'll go ahead and turn on intensity and pan and tilt as what we want to link. And now if I change down to four, you can see they stay in sync. If I go and change the speed, they both change the speed. So a fix link allows us when we're building an effect that has multiple parameters on it. It allows us to link together once we've set the swings because they're gonna be separate. Um, 
it allows us to link together that speed and that timing, that wave or step, so that we're able to, you know, start dialing it in. And then when it comes to that point of setting the timing the way we like it, this one's kind of cool because it's shooting across diagonally. Um, we're able to go and modify those together and keep them together when we play it back. Okay. And then we can go ahead and record that as we always would. And it's going to work exactly the same way that we saw it. And so we're totally able to do that. Um, so that is a great option there as well. Effects link. Um, it's one of those that's definitely, if you haven't messed with it before, you've seen that button there, you're like, what in the world is this? Um, then now you realize that, okay, um, it's actually very useful. It's very helpful. And it can allow you to create some really interesting effects because without it, I'm actually just going back, we'll program or undo here. Without it, if I turn a link off and then I change the speed of one of them, now we don't have the same effect. Now only half of it changed speed. Or if I change the timing of one of them, say I go to eight and I'm on tilt, then my tilt is happening with that wave of eight, but my intensity is still using the wave of five. They've gotten out of sync. Now, sometimes that's what you want, but other times you want to keep them in sync. That's exactly what affects sync does. Awesome. Let's go ahead. I'm just going to check the questions here. Oh, good question. So when you're in a queue list and you have effects, how would you stop effects within that queue list? Great question. So in your next queue, as you're working through in your programming, all you would need to do is just go ahead and set your swing to stop to zero. Okay. That's going to be the best way. Setting this, if you set the, the um, I'll just show you here. If you set the speed, so we got swing and, and speed both going here. And if we set some effects timing, I'm just gonna tilt these again. We get a nice effect going. Um, but if we stop the speed, some of the lights are like halfway in the effect, halfway off. Whereas if we stop the swing, the lights now leave the effect. It's just the base value. You're good and that's gonna track forward. Great question. Uh, does it matter which order you select the parameters in effects link? No, it does not um, because they're just linking together. None is higher than the other or anything like that. Um, so they're just going to be at the same, at the same uh, priority level there. Awesome. Great. Cool. So that was, that's good. That is very good. So for now, I'm going to stop on questions. I know there's more in there. Some of the guys will, will answer those and I'm so thankful for them to be here to help with that because there's a couple more topics I wanna to hit in here that are, that are really helpful. I know we're trying to pack a lot in this webinar and I realize you can't cover everything in just a couple of webinars, but some good stuff we wanna to get to. So macros, macros and MIDI. I get a lot of questions about this. We get a lot of questions about this. And so what I wanna do is show you some of the macros. Now macros are found in the queue list values window. And I'm gonna go back to bank one for this and go to my, uh, this cue list, everybody blue. And macros are, once we're in edit mode, something that we can add. Now macros add to cues and allow us to automate things within our show. So we can go ahead and click on any of the cues, or if we're in it and we're playing it, we hit add macro. Then we get this undefined macro that we can then press upon. When we press on that undefined macro, we get this drop down. This is where we can get into setting macros, okay? So at the simplest level, there's the trigger. So if you want to make a cue go when you press another cue, um, you can do that here so that you can, you can automate. Maybe every time you want to go into your video look, you go into, you also fire a cue that turns off your stage wash. So you just go trigger. You go find your queue list. They are numbered in the order you recorded them in. That's the same order that they're going to be in in the queue list directory. And uh, and then once you set the queue list, you set the queue number, either one if it just has one queue on it, or if it has multiple queues, then um, you can enter the exact queue number. And then, very important, my window is a little bit small here. I'm going to maximize it. You do need to apply. 
then you see the readout right here and it's going to trigger that cue when you come to it. Uh, there are many other macros as well too. So there's release and pause and select and select as main. Um, so those all work in the same way where you're choosing a queue list and then queues if that applies. Um, going to banks, um, releasing all your queue lists, releasing all your queue list period, all the regular queue lists, all the overrides, setting a particular queue list to a certain value. Um, and then there is MIDI macro. So actually before MIDI macro, there's also just to read them off, release queue lists and banks. Those are pretty self-explanatory that you actually set a range of queue list numbers that you would release when that macro hits, when that queue plays. Um, and then you have uh, time code macros as well, where you can start pause and reset the internal time code. Um, but the one that we get a lot of questions are, are the MIDI macros. Um, they are a thing of wonder. So the MIDI macros are a way that you can fire different cues. As you can see here, you can select any of your cue lists, then set, you know, go, pause, release, flash, all these different options. And you can do that to a MIDI note. Now a MIDI note is going to be generated a number of different ways. For example, here, when you pull up the MIDI macro, you get this MIDI event viewer, and I'm gonna press a button on a MIDI controller that's in front of me. I get a MIDI note on and off. If I move a fader, I get a lot of MIDI information on my, my MIDI controller. And so you can use MIDI controllers, you can use other software like uh, ProPresenter or Proclaim, those lyrics programs that are very popular. Um, you could send commands via MIDI from an audio console, from QLab um, in the theater. There are a lot of different programs that can generate these type of signals. You can then capture them in the MIDI event viewer. Once you capture them, you just click on them and it's going to assign those, that information from the MIDI note that just came through, or you could choose it manually. And it's going to apply it once we hit apply to that MIDI macro. Now, a couple of notes about MIDI macros that really confuse people. You don't typically put your MIDI macro in the cue list that you want to fire with that MIDI button or with that command from ProPresenter or whatever you may be using, okay? Because in order for the macro to fire, the cue list actually has to be active that contains that macro. So what I'd like to do is just record a blank cue list. Just literally clear out, press record, make a new blank cue list. I'm not gonna do it right now because I'm out of space on this bank. Um, and then put my MIDI macros on that MIDI cue list. I call it MIDI arm or MIDI enable. And then I have it auto start at boot or I start it manually. And that basically activates the MIDI. It turns on those macros so that they're listening for the MIDI events to come through. And then when the applicable MIDI event comes through, it then reacts, it then triggers, it presses go or whatever on the target cue list, and then it fires, okay? And so there's a lot of confusion there as to, you know, what goes on there. And so hopefully um, that helps you. And even if you never thought about using macros before, if you ever find yourself in a show where you're repeating something over and over again, something happens and then something else. Maybe you're in a theatrical type cue list and you have an effect or something or a chase or something you need to fire at a particular point in time. The macros are, a, um, are definitely a place that you can do that. And this is, this is where they are. Now, as mentioned, when we're talking about MIDI, there are also MIDI show control and MIDI time code. We talked about MIDI show control a little bit earlier and MIDI show control just being a actual format of MIDI notes that different um, show control type things use. So their messages like Q5 Go that are basically encrypted into MIDI, they're sent via MIDI. And then if two devices both run MIDI show control, they can send these generic show control messages and keep each other in sync. Um, again, it's not something that I see a lot anymore. It used to be something that was more popular, but it still gets used from time to time, um, you know, within, within real life. Um, MIDI time code, on the other hand, is a type of time code with the time code cue list, okay? And so the time code cue list is where, like I mentioned before, 
you have a music track or a video or what have you playing. You have a, a generating source of time code and then the console is just going to automatically follow. And so I thought I'd do a quick demo for you on that here. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm going to just delete all macros on this queue list so there's no funny business going on. And I'm gonna turn this into a time code queue list. Then I'm gonna set a couple things up. So I'm doing this on one computer. And so I'm gonna use a MIDI time code and I'm gonna use a program called Loop MIDI, which just takes the MIDI from one program and gets it into the other program. Then I'm gonna go into the Onyx, into the menu settings, IO settings, MIDI devices, make sure that all my Loop MIDI port that I created is, at, created is active. If I don't see it here, I can press scan and it should show up. And I'm gonna to go to time code, MIDI time code, make this active. There used to be an apply button, but now there's not, that's okay. Um, and then I'm going to open um, a program called Time Alert, which has a demo version, but if you're gonna use it live, you do need to pay for it because it pauses um, and it starts your editor. And Time Alert is just one way to generate time code. Um, there are many, that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of a webinar that's covering multiple things, but it, it's definitely one way to do it. And I'm just gonna go create a new queue in here, make it a silent timer because I don't have a track in here. I don't wanna do that. I start at zero and I go to, I'll just go to uh, 23 hours. So when you have time code values, we're gonna run into this in Onyx in a minute. It's hours, two digits out of 24, minutes, 60, seconds, 60, and then frames, uh, typically 30. Oops. That was not the right button to say it. I type in my 23 there and I press apply. And then in this particular program, in the show setup, I go to MIDI devices. I set my output to loop MIDI. And then I press play. And then I see right here, my MIDI time code going in Onyx to see if I stop it. I go back, I press play again. We see the time code. So that's the first step to, to a time code cue list in Onyx. All right. The next step is triggering. So I can go in here and I can type, if I'm in edit mode, within any of these time code um, times, I can set a time. I actually want to clear this one. So I'm gonna set it to dash for manual trigger. Um, because what I wanna do is clear that out. So I'm actually gonna record a queue 0.5 before it. Because with time code queue lists, your first queue, I often make it a queue 0.5 like this. Um, it needs to be a queue that activates the queue list and does nothing else. I mean, it can do other things. It can, you know, move lights to different places, but ultimately it's just there to make the queue list active so that it's listening for time code. Then, we can enter those values, as I mentioned, hours, minutes, seconds, um, frames. Or if we're in edit mode, we have learn timing main go. So that takes the main go key, the big go button, and has it learn timing, okay? And oops, I probably accidentally tried to quit time mode there. And I'm gonna play my time code. So we got time code moving. And then I can just hit my big go button. So we see there, as I hit the big go button, I'll wait a second here. It is tracking changes. Now, if I leave cues as manual trigger, they're going to trigger manually. Um, but if they're if they have time code values, they will pick up when time code code is going. So I'm going to pop this out of edit mode. Of course, stopping and starting the time code here is not going to do you any good. Though, if you are just testing, you can click up here. You can go to internal time code, um, and then that's just self generated time code and TC follow needs to be on in order for it to listen. Then I'll restart back to my uh, starter queue. Of course, it jumped ahead because I didn't start and reset my time code first. So I'm gonna start that, go back to the start. And then I'm gonna go ahead, TC follows on out of edit mode, perfect. Then I can play. And oops, I forgot to start the queue list, so I'll start it late. And you see, it jumps through, it catches me up. 
it's now following the time code value exactly. So at 15 seconds, it's going to go ahead again. And now we're following time code. So that is the basics of making a time code queue list. Now it's just going to hang here forever till I trigger it manually. Um, and that then you're good to go. Um, obviously, I know that talking about time code opens up a billion other queue questions about other different um, types of time code and other different um, you know sources of time code and, and specifics there. And we really don't have time to get into that today. If we have time at the end, we could talk about maybe some of that. Um, but at the end of the day, this is here as a demo, um, but we're not going to definitely have time to get through a lot of that stuff. So I'm just going to stop that guy and get out of there. Uh, the biggest thing to remember with time code, like I said before, is that main go button with, with the learn is what you have to press, not the go on the queue list itself for it to, to enter the time in the queue list. And then also having that queue at the start to activate the time code queue list so that it's listening for time code. Okay. And then you'd be good to go. All right. Um, when time code is controlling, um, time code wins. Uh, as long as time code is streaming, uh, you're not able to fire around that queue list at all. You'd want to do that from your time code device. Yeah. So, do, 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 do. DMX input. Oh, DMX input is so much fun. Okay. So, DMX input is one of those things that you may not realize is available in Onyx, but it's very powerful. So, let's go into it. DMX in input is in the main settings in menu. And it's hiding right here in DMX in. Okay, by default, it looks like this. Everything's grayed out. And across the bottom, we have some different options. So Onyx has built in via DMX input a really wide variety of ways that you can take a, a DMX feed. Maybe it's another console that's streaming data and you want to merge it together. Maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a a, a old um, console, you know, just a old conventional light console that has a whole bunch of faders on it. And you want to go ahead and, um, and utilize that just to control playbacks in Onyx or to control intensity for specific lights. All of these things can be done via the DMX input. And it's actually really powerful. So the first thing you got to do is figure out how you want to get DMX input into your console. In this example, I can use the four internal ports on my NX wing. I just need to use a, a barrel adapter to get, you know, the DMX uh, in the opposite direction. I can use a USB to DMX. So that's Onyx USB devices. And I can send uh, ArtNet information from another console. So if you're in, you know, like a festival situation, you're merging multiple consoles together you can send universes from another console and merge it through Onyx. So the first thing to do is this is going to be universe by universe. So you'll want to turn on, you click one of the ports. These are just virtual ports to keep you organized, um, just a DMX in assignment. And you first turn on that port on the routing screen, okay? You set the input source. So here I'm using the internal port on this, this wing here that I have. Um, but it could be USB. It could be ArtNet. Um, I'm going to leave it where it is. So I don't have actually have a console hooked up here right now. Then we go and we have mergers, mapping and playback control. So these are the three different options of how you can apply that DMX input. So now we have merger one through 16. So these match up with port one through 16 here. They're the same thing. Okay. So we can turn that on if we want that port to merge into the DMX output. So in that case, you would be bringing up the actual DMX channels. You would have to have your lights patched on that external console, and they would merge through Onyx. And then whichever is the highest in HTTP mode or the latest in LTP mode would get the output. Okay. There are more settings here. There's, there's a lot here, a lot of depth, as there often is with Onyx, where you can set the, you can filter out the DMX addresses so that you're not um, using the whole universe, everything that's coming in there, you can filter that. You can change the merge universe. So it can be any of the universes in Onyx and the starting address on that merged into universe, you can also modify it if you need to. Um, 
You can merge, so that's just gonna go straight to output. You can merge and capture. That allows you to load values into the programmer or capture only, which just allows you to load from that merge, okay? You can also, this is kind of an and or situation, do mapping. Mapping is my favorite one, I think. So what you're able to do is you activate each port, first of all, with mapping. You can clear the layout if you were playing with it earlier like me. And then I've got, okay, I've got internal DMX1. I can start, to, I can choose a queue list here for it to control. It can control one queue list. It can control many queue lists. So it's going to control that fader level. Um, if we look to the manual though, it does control just a little bit more than just simply the fader manual, the fader level. I'm going to pull up this chart here. Um, so it actually controls, just to show you, the way it's set up is that when the fader's a zero to 200, so that's out of 255 on DMX, you're getting the fader level. Then there's a little, a little a no function area. And then if you bring that fader to full, you actually fire a go. So the cool thing about it is you can use an old DMX console, you know, an old board with a bunch of faders on it, whatever, and set it in this window to be assigned to a certain queue list. Um, I'm gonna close time, Lord. I know, I know, but I don't use it much. Um, and so you can go ahead and literally assign queue list to faders on that old console. And then you get the ability to not only have fader level, but also to have that control. Now, the, the last option, playback control, is a little bit different. It's actually, instead of um, using the mapping, routing, et cetera, you would turn all this off and then you would have playback control. And so this is the source port from the routing tab, the routing tab you do need. Um, and then this follows the chart here at the bottom of the manual on the DMX input page, where um, each channel, where channel one is your playback pages, channel two is your playback buttons, channel three is the queue number, channel four is the command. So it's a way that you could automate things potentially, um, probably not via a board of faders, but maybe a more simple control board could fire things in Onyx by sending some specific values because it would send the page number, then it would send the button on the playback. This is the playback buttons pages. Then it sends the queue number within that. And then the fourth channel on there, you fire a go or a pause or whatever. Um, and so not really something you're probably gonna do sitting at a little console moving faders around, but it is the kind of thing that can be useful. It's in there. And uh, it's pretty easy to set up and it's there for you if that's something that you would desire. Awesome, very cool. Very cool. So this is the point in the show. I'm glad we had time for this today where I wanna take some of the questions that we've had here because I know I, I you know, moved through things fairly quickly. We covered a lot today and I know there's more questions, especially about effects and whatnot. So again, we're using the question and answer section and I'm gonna go through some of these questions that are in here. Of course, Bob and Matthias are in there so that you are able to, um, you know, they can answer anything that's a simple answer and anything that really makes sense to cover via video, I'm gonna cover here, okay? Let me close this window here, close this guy. Awesome. So how does pan 10 fixtures spread like a fan at a time, uh, Jairic asked. So Jairic, what I would do, is uh, do go back and watch our webinar, our last webinar, the intermediate one, okay? But I will show you as well here because we go over fanning all that in much more depth. But I can go ahead, grab my lights here, pan tilt, say I get them, let me clear out all these cues. There's a lot going on here. Cool. So I go ahead, start over, grab these lights, tilt them out, tilt them up so we can see click on pan or press on it on my on my console, tap the encoder wheel or just move it a little. Then I click over to um, fanning. So it's just like effects, but this time we go to fanning. And now it says first fanning on pan. And now I can use my encoder wheels or this graphical interface to, to fan the lights. And you see that I'm fanning the pan across them now. And so that'll work with any parameter um, but it does work with fan there. You're able to messing with these options. You get a lot of cool different things. All right. Um, 
Geary says, can you can you explain unblocking QLess? Okay, unblock. Well, I'm gonna have to remember exactly what that button does. And then, yeah. So what you're able to do is um, if you're making a queue list, okay, I jogged my memory on exactly what that does. So if you're making a queue list and between Q2 and Q3, um, your fuse washes in this example, both are at 100% and you actually took them to full and recorded that actual value in both those queues, okay? Um, that's going to, to basically make it so that it's not gonna track through. If I changed in Q1 down to 80%, Q2 would have that value of 100%, and maybe you didn't want that to go through. You can press the unblock queue list button and it runs a little command where it looks for stuff like that and it actually unblocks them. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, it's definitely used in the theatrical sense more often than anything else. Um, there are some good examples in the met manual as well if you want more there. It just, what it does is it looks for any place where multiple queues in a row have the same hard value recorded and then it clears those up so that there's tracking through those. Um, probably not something you, you need a lot, um, but maybe you do. Is there a way, Octavio asked, to, for the override to not suddenly enter pan and tilt effects and gradually enter? So Octavio, um, it's always going to, by default, an override's always going to start that pan and tilt moving. But you could use a cue blender to do what you're looking to accomplish, okay? So as, did I hear somebody jump on there? No. As an example, um, I could go here and start to build an effect on tilt. Yeah, I hear somebody there. Somebody chiming in? All right, one of you guys, um, your uh, mic is on, whether you think it is or not. Yeah, so just so you're aware. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, got that back off. So um, what we would do is build our first queue in the override with, um, I guess, no effect. You would just have like here they're pointing to a position um, so that you gain yourself a little space at the bottom. I guess you could technically even use a blank queue. It depends what else is on that queue list, right? And then we start our effect. Maybe I just do something on tilt here. Yay. And I record that second cue. And then I don't think I did active and inactive, but that's okay. We'll do cue blender. I have to adjust that second cue. And so then they do come to position like in that first half of the cube blender and the second half would be the, the effect. And you could simplify that, you know, I don't need that first half for the little transition into the position, right? And so I could go into the cue list values and reset those cube blender from and to options. If I go into edit mode, you know, I could just make it the first 10% and then make that one. Uh, oops, I set the comment. 10 to 100. And then in that case, this guy would go ahead and the first 10% would basically move it into position. The rest would be the effect. And so it would kind of be a slower start there. Yeah, absolutely. So a cue blender could definitely accomplish what you need. It depends on what else you're putting on that cue as to exactly what that would look like. Um, another question, this one comes up a lot, is what about making effects that are from the center out or symmetrical or something like that? Great question about effects. That's where we're gonna use the grouping tool. Now we went over the grouping tool in the intermediate webinar. I highly recommend watching that, but I'll demo it here with effects specifically. So what I like to do is grab, we'll just grab our spots because they're on the front here. And then we'll go intensity and we'll go to effects, get something built. Great, so they're now coming on zero to full. Just go ahead and tilt them out so we can see them real good. And then I want to go ahead to grouping. We can also do this actually the last um, in effects time. What was I thinking? The last column is grouping tools. 
And these last ones, fan, whatever, fan, every X, fan, block of X, etc. Those are the ones you want to use when you're doing something like this. So say I do a fan mirror per, per two. And then I set an effects timing. So I'm going to set that to five. Um, what that basically looks like is, okay, I've got 10 fixtures selected. So if I set a mirror per two, basically outside to inside, um, that's because that's the selection order. It starts on the left and goes to the right in this example. So it starts on the outside. Um, then what I get is I get an outside to inside effect. But I can flip that if I had the best way to do this is to just flip the effects mode. And it happens like that. It goes now inside to outside, okay? Um, the grouping tools can do a lot when working with effects. Like for example, say I just did block of two. And then I set my waiver step. Maybe I set that to two as well. Now you see, maybe I set that to three. Yeah, now it does a three step kind of mirrored chase effect. So there's a lot in there, definitely something to uh, pay attention to as well. Um, and June asks, can this mini macro affects MPC tools in total? Um, so if Matthias wants to talk about any future plans, I know there's been hints about what may happen to MIDI in the future. For now, um, you can with the MIDI macros do MIDI buttons really well. I find the fader functionality is kind of funky. Um, I've never been able to get them to go where it doesn't jump when the fader hits the bottom, jump back up to full uh, with the MIDI controllers I have in the settings I've tried. You can do a lot with them. Um, and I know there's a future potential MIDI functionality that's been teased that would allow you to unlock a full MIDI functionality, um, whether that be with an Onyx key or something like that. Um, that's not all determined, I don't believe. Uh, what does the macro key on the console do? Um, I believe absolutely nothing. There are a couple keys on the console that don't do squat. And I believe macro is one of them as well as a swap programmer. Uh, maybe they'll come in the future, maybe not. They just keep people wondering. It's a good button to hit. You know how sound guys, um, you know, always have a knob to turn when a client or somebody asks for something and they don't want to give it to them. You know, that's what, uh, that is definitely what the, uh, the macro key or the swap programmers for. Um, does time code via art network? Yeah, absolutely. So in the time code options, we have the ability to do LTC. So that's gonna be the physical um, connectors on a lot of the, the consoles. Then we have um, the B and C connector, that's old. Uh, then we have the ability to do the uh, Link. So I believe that is some of the consoles. BNC connector is gone on all the newer consoles. Yeah, so. that's like way gone. That's like way old. Yeah. <laughs> um, then there is the ArtNet timecode um, internal, which is self generated, and then the MIDI, which also can be sent over networks. Um, and so, yeah, those are all options as well. One thing for sure is it doesn't read audio. Like it's not like you can plug audio timecode into your laptop and just feed it in. It needs an actual hardware device like the um, what's in the consoles or the dedicated NX sync. Like we cannot just read audio and get out and um, get timecode out of it. You need a dedicated timecode device. Yes, and that is a, that's not something the company is doing. That's a limitation of the timecode format. You need timecode hardware to read it correctly. Um, absolutely. Um, great question about the delay shift and weight. Yeah, I didn't go over that, um, but if anybody else has questions, feel free to pop those in here at the end here. So delay shift and weight are actually a function of the effects timing, the wave or step. So what you're gonna see, let's just build a quick effect here just so we have some, some data in the programmer. So if we go in here, we set up the swing and speed that's all we see in the programmer, but then we hit wave and we, we assign something here. What we see, I know it's probably small on your screen, is we get delay, shift, and weight, but it's different for every fixture, okay? So I've personally, I know some people have said they actually touch those sometimes, but the wave or step control is actually setting those values. 
And so you don't ever need to touch that. I know some people have said, I've seen it before. People say, oh yeah, I touch those in certain circumstances. I've never personally seen the need, but it's basically how it, how it delays or, or whatnot, the effect across the different units. It's exactly what the effects timing, the, the wave and step is doing. So you don't need to pay attention to that. Okay. Um, not at all. Um, it's going to do that automatically. It's just there. Um, let's see, Grandmaster Control. That's a great question. So you cannot in Onyx put the Grandmaster on another fader. Okay, now if you're on a console, like I'm on my wing here, I've got a rotary Grandmaster fader that I'm turning up and down right now. But just because you don't have a Grandmaster um, and you can't like put the technical Grandmaster on a fader doesn't mean you can't have one. Okay, so all you would need to do, I'm just going to play something back here, go back a bank. And all I'm going to do is select everything, which if you have an all group, that's easy. Of course, I don't. And take their intensity to full and build an inhibitive fader, right? Record that. I'm going to switch my banks here on my console to an inhibitive fader. Call it Grandmaster. And now you have exactly what you're looking for. So if I clear that, I now have on my fader, I'm just moving this, this fader in the physical world. I now have what is essentially a Grandmaster through the inhibitive. It's going to work exactly the same way. Um, it's going to do exactly the same thing a Grandmaster would do. It just happens to be, um, you know, a inhibitive versus the technical Grandmaster, but the function's going to be the same. Awesome. So creating an effects speed override, somebody wanted to go over that again. And if there are more questions, and I'm glad to keep taking them for a few minutes, or else we'll go back over where to get support when you have questions later, because as you're working in the software, you'll probably come up with some. Um, the effects speed override is very simple. What I always tell people is before you build any effects, like one of the first things you do when you start the software, when you start a new show, is you want to go ahead and you want to um, be able to just grab all the lights that you've got, all the different types, go to effects program, turn on effects link, select all, okay? Um, you will have to go if you have different parameters across different lights and select them individually. When I start with the lights that have the most parameters, and then we get everything as we go down. So now we've got literally everything selected. House lights, select all. We've now selected all the parameters in link. Then we go to over to effects and the only thing we touch is speed. We set that wherever we think our maximum speed would be. Um, I find, you know, for most shows, I mean, unless it's like a rave, 70% is pretty good. Um, you know, you can just go all the way, but you might not use the top of that fader ever. Excuse me. And then you can go ahead and record that to an override. Call it effect speed. Again, it needs to be an override. And then you bring that up so that you clear out. And when you're actually recording effects, this is just speed. If you bring it up by itself, it's not going to do a thing. But you leave it up. And when you're recording effects, you then are setting your swing. You know, I'm on, I don't know what I'm on. Oh, I got everything linked. So say I go to intensity, I grab my swing and I bring that up, okay? Speed wise, I don't touch that. I clearly messed something up in demonstrating that. Um, but speed wise, I don't touch speed. I only touch uh, swing. Speed is determined by this fader, mode multiplier, effects timing. I set all that stuff um, in the individual cues, but I don't set the speed so that I then go ahead and um, just trying to see what I did. Doesn't matter. I then go ahead and my effect speed is always controlled by that speed fader. Can you bank safe a cue list to a fader, Ted says? Um, not directly, Ted. So what you can do is there's not really an option to lock a particular cue on every bank to that fader. But in Onyx, it's not that the fader is controlling the queue. 
but the fader is just a link back to the queue list. So you can just go ahead, copy, press bank forward, like I'm doing it on my console here, bank forward, you know, oops, I didn't hit the one first though, I missed it. So copy, hit the queue list you want, move forward on the bank, press the, the queue list, copy, press the queue list, forward, click, copy. It's even right next to the bank button on the, on the consoles forward click and before you know it you've copied it to all your banks um, and then that queue list is on every bank so again you know same solution um and um you know you're you're totally there yeah awesome guys cool we've had a lot of good stuff here uh, we're about done there was one more you know there's there's things i have on the list here that i was like you know if we had a minute um we could do that um, you can copy cues, Aaron, um, but but what I want to show here real quick is um, is that we so Aaron we went over that in the intermediate webinar um, to duplicate the cue list. So look at that because uh, we did go over that in video. Um, but when you're laying out effects, one of the really cool things about how Onyx works, specifically if you're putting things on the playback buttons page, is just like with the effects speed fader that we're back here where I can separate out speed and have that control separate from an effect on a different fader. Um, the same goes for any other part of the effects. And that's one of the really powerful things about Onyx that is here, okay? So I could go ahead and grab my lights here and say I went in here and wanted to, you know, by default, sure. These lights are running the pan tilt effect and they're running this color effect and they're doing it in this formation, whatever, uh, whatever the timing is set to. But maybe I want to make a button that sets different wave values. Like I set a wave to two or I set a wave to eight or I turn the wave completely off. I can then, if I touch just that, I, I set, get my effects running and then I touch just the wave, I could then go ahead and record a button that actually would override that. And I could play that back. I could hit that override on a button um, and just play that back by itself and override it on the fly. I could do that with timing. Um, same with the modes. So maybe I've got an intensity effect running along in a queue and it's on the sine wave mode. I could build a button here in Qless values just by going to the intensity effect, only touching the mode. And then I could go ahead and record that, you know, record these different modes as buttons and call those up as needed. Just hit those buttons, be able to get a lot of different effects all at once here. Um, and so that's another super cool thing that you guys can do in here. Um, it's just to be able to get the thing that I love about the way that all the parameters are separate in Onyx and all the effects work as regular parameters. And this can take a minute to wrap your head around. The thing that I love about it is it gives you the freedom to lay out your show file, where if you want to split out your effects and have a whole grid of different options of different shapes and different swing levels and a speed fader, you can mix and match and have so many different effects at your fingertips without recording like 10,000 cueless. Um, and that is a, a lot of the power that is here within Onyx. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for hanging out today. As we had talked earlier, we discussed um, where to find all the support. The main site that you want to know about is, um, is at obsidiancontrol.com. Uh, and you definitely want to check that out. All the links to everything else are there. And uh, thank you so much for coming today. It's been a lot of fun teaching you guys. I hope you enjoyed this. And more importantly, that you learned something today. Um, because ultimately, uh, especially when, when times are down or, you know, uh, we can't do as many events. Um, it's a great time to learn and build up your skills. Thanks for hanging out today. Um, it's been great having you.